Yep, we're just here. Yeah, okay. Ooh, all right. Thank you. Where did you get to? We're just just here. Just over okay. there. Okay. Chair person. Yeah. Well, I think we're all here. Okay. Okay, members. I don't think we have any apologies. So, agenda item two is chairperson's business. Can I advise members in terms of our special educational needs briefings uh, that I understand that the Education Authority has informally declined to provide a briefing as scheduled on the 11th of March 2020 on SEND delivery, including particular issues with statementing. The Education Authority appears to have suggested that it will be unable to provide a briefing until the internal audit report on statementing is available. Can I, I seek members' views, uh, given the concerns we have in relation to uh, special educational needs, um, whether the Education Authority's inability to provide information on the current statement in black backlog is a, a problem, and ask members if we should write to the Minister indicating our concerns and seeking uh, a schedule uh, for this briefing. Uh, bring members in on that, William. Uh, thanks, sir. Um, well, can I just say that um, I don't think I don't think it's adequate for them to write back and and say that uh, they can't provide uh, a briefing to the committee uh, until the audit is is um, what you understand. But they need to be telling us when the audit and then what when the timeline is for the audit, uh, and then obviously. Um, when they will be appearing in front of this committee, because this is a hugely, hugely important issue. Uh, members will all be aware of, of these issues in terms of their own constituency offices um, and dealings that they've had with, with schools and principals. So I do think, and I, I would I would propose that we write to the Minister around the issue. Okay. Robin, Eaton. No, I totally agree, Chair. This is not uh, something that has happened recently. This is a, a history. Uh, behind this, stretching back uh, a number of years now. And indeed, they, I think the frustration, to put it at its uh, mildest, that uh, we experienced uh, in our conversations with the uh, leadership group, um, I, I think is just um, mm -hmm. uh, highlights the need for it as an issue to be brought out into to the open uh, chair. Well, I, I join with William. I, I, I really. It's disappointing uh, that the department have taken that. Okay, Robbie Butler. Yep. Um, just to echo the, 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 the members' um, sentiments there. I think this is it's really important actually that we, we make a, almost a statement of intent with regard to how seriously we take this issue because whilst we are all very aware through constituency offices and, and even through the briefings we've had of the, the building pressures in SEN and the statementing process, and the, without wanting to prejudice any outcome of the audit, what would have been nice perhaps was some better information with regard to what steps are being taken at the moment to tackle that outside of the audit. And I would hope that um, there isn't a paralysis by analysis at the moment within the Education Authority because that would be horrendous. Uh, for the outcomes of those children and families that are desperately needing uh, assistance and support at the moment. Okay. And Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen. Yes, just reiterating what everybody else said. I think, given the fact that at the the, the last briefing we weren't mm. given a time frame of when we were likely see, to see the outcome of the audit um, and the importance of the issue, and um, I suppose uh, you know the pressures that's there. So we do need to, I do agree we should write to the Minister. I know we had asked for a breakdown of the extra ten million and it's in the pack, but it's big headings. We don't see how that is going down in the schools. So um, we you know we would have used that opportunity to get that discussion going with them around um, how that money was going to help with the pressures as well. So I do think um, we need to write to the Minister and, and, and get that briefing as soon as possible. Okay, members. In summary, then, write to the Minister, seek a date for completion of the EA interna internal audit of SEN administration, a date for briefing the committee, an early date for briefing the committee, a opportunity to respond to a more detailed breakdown of how the £10 million allocated for SEN is going to be spent. Um, 
and an urgent response on all those matters. Members agreed and content to approach that. Rob, tag on to that, Chair. I mean, the uh, leadership group who we met were expecting us to pursue this matter. Yeah. Um, would it be members agree that we write to whoever the leader of the leadership group is to to let them know what the response has been from the? Yeah, and Clark, my understanding that the. Special Schools Principal Strategic Leadership Group will be briefing the committee in due course. Chairperson, yes, 11th of March. Uh, the committee had sought a briefing from the Strategic Leadership Group on special schools and then a separate briefing from the Education Authority. Um, I've been contacted by both parties. They've indicated they want to brief together uh, on the 11th of March. Um, so it would be the Education Authority and the Strategic Leadership Group um, indicating the, uh, the challenges and uh, I guess the way forward. Uh, on special schools. That's so just on special schools though, indeed, yeah, not yes. the wider SEN issues then? No. That's correct. So okay. the department then on that day will brief on the SEN uh, framework, the new SEN framework, but what the committee had also sought uh, was a briefing <coughs> on SEN delivery from the Education Authority, including the statementing issue, and that's when EA came back to me and said, no, not at this time. <coughs> okay, so members content the right to the Minister on those matters then? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you. Okay then. Um, agenda item 2.2 is informal meetings. Can I remind members that informal meetings have been arranged as follows uh, at lunchtime on Tuesday the 10th of March with the Children's Law Centre, Tuesday the 1st of April with Parenting NI and Parent Kind, and Tuesday the 22nd of April with the sectoral bodies. Can I ask if going forward and after Easter members would like these informal meetings to perhaps be managed to two Tuesdays per month? I'm conscious that there has been a, a pretty severe clash with other appointments on, on those Tuesday lunch times. Would two allocating two Tuesdays per month, perhaps the last two Tuesdays of, of the month, um, for those informal meetings be a wise approach going forward? Members content with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Agreed. Okay, members, uh, refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of 12th of February, page 6. Can I seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Agreed? Agreed. Okay. There are no matters arising. Unless members need to raise any matters? No. Okay, then. Agenda item 5 is our Department of Education briefing on the budget and Programme for Government outcomes. Can I refer members to the following documents, a briefing paper <coughs> from the clerk on the 2020-21 Department of Education budget and 2017-22 Programme for Government outturns at page 14 of your pack. Page 26 of your pack is the Departmental Research Budget presentation and at page 33, Departmental Written Briefing on PFG. A uh, memo from the clerk to the Committee for Finance on resource requirements on the Budget Bill 2020 is at page 38, and in table items uh, at page 3 includes a revised set of uh, questions and a departmental paper at page 7 with relevant extracts from the Spring Supplementary Estimates at page 23, and forwarded correspondence from the Minister of Finance at page 64. Come in. Okay. Can I welcome our officials then? We have Gary Fair, the Director of Finance in the Department of Education, and Susan Anderson, Assistant Director of Finance. Witnesses we have a few more uh, witnesses to follow as well, just give them an opportunity to pick their seats. You're very welcome, everyone. Okay. So I, th I think then we also have Pauline Donnan. Is that correct? Yeah. Head of yeah. Analytical Services. Karen McCulloch, Head of School Improvement. <coughs> Alison Chambers, Director of Promoting Collaboration and Tackling Disadvantage. And Paul Brush, Director of Youth and Early Years. You're all very welcome. Uh, the executive budget process for 2021 is obviously underway and will include a debate in the Assembly on the 25th of <coughs> February. We ask for this briefing in order to inform any contribution that our committee would make to this important process. And we also ask to hear about the department's programme for government outturns. 
So I thank officials for making themselves available today at short notice. Um, advise officials and members that the evidence session will be reported by Hansard. And can I invite officials to make a short presentation of no more than 10 to 15 minutes and then open the floor to questions. Gary, would you like to start? Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll kick off on the finance side Thank, first. Thanks very much. Probably. Um, now, I wasn't sure how you wanted to handle it. Uh, I've been up and I, and I ran through some slides before in terms of the, the budget uh, that we had present, or the, the bids that we had put to the Department of Finance. I think uh, maybe if I kick off just by talking through the process of where we are now and, and where it's leading us to, hopefully. So next week, on the 24th of February, it's the Supply Resolution and Budget Bill Debates. That essentially, <coughs> uh, it isn't the budget position. Uh, the budget position is still being negotiated. Uh, executive ministers are still uh, engaging. There was a bilateral yesterday that our minister had with the finance minister, so that, that process, process is still ongoing. And as I understand it, the finance minister will meet again, probably with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, just to see where that will take us to. The, so the, the supply resolution and budget bill on Monday, that essentially uh, um, it provides legislative authority for changes that have taken place through the year. So as you know, we have had additional allocations throughout the year. Uh, and there's an assumption that that can be spent, although legislatively it's not covered until the spring supplementary estimates when that bill is passed. That gives the department the full legislative cover to spend all additional money throughout the year. And it, it's the last opportunity in the year as well to make any amendments that may have to be made if we've had money coming in from other departments or whatever. It also provides a vote on account for the new financial year. This, uh, this is a normal part of the process. It normally gives about 40% of what a budget might look like for next year and enables spend to continue, even though a budget bill isn't passed normally until June. So there's two stages, really. This is the first budget bill, which covers all of spend for this year and provides the ability for departments to spend up to 40% in the new financial year. So it keeps, keeps the wheels of government moving. Um, <clears throat> then once a budget is agreed, the, the date is the, the Westminster date for the bud Chancellor's announcement is still, it has been confirmed as the 11th of March. There was some uncertainty around that, given that the, there's a new Chancellor of the Exchequer. But uh, it was confirmed yesterday by the Finance Minister that that date still stands. Now, the discussion is still ongoing in the Department of Finance as to whether uh, the Executive might want to agree some kind of a budget before that. There's an issue around uh, a legal requirement to have a budget in place before the end of this financial year. But it's the conundrum that uh, the executive is in that if, there's, if there was additional money potentially coming through the Chancellor's announcement uh, on the 11th of March, obviously it would make more sense to, you know, f for that to be reflected on a budget that's agreed. So I'm not quite sure where that will go yet. I don't think that's been confirmed. But uh, I suppose we're just responding. There's not a clear pathway, I suppose, in terms of timing. But that's that's just to make you aware. The 11th of March is the Chancellor's announcement, and they're. Who knows, there may be additional resources coming out of that. There will also be further discussions uh, among finance ministers you know, in terms of agreeing a budget for next year. So none of that is confirmed at this stage. We have, like other departments, our minister has made the pitch for the resources that we need for next year. Uh, and I went through the detail of that. I'm happy to pick up on any particular aspects with you today. But we've made our bid, and it's a matter of waiting then and seeing. Um, <coughs> As I said the last time, the executive, executive ministers are doing all they can, I think, to secure, to maximise the resources for next year. There's big pressures, as you know, big pressures in our department and other pressures across other departments. So there are challenges. So that's, that's roughly the plan, as much as I know at this stage. And I'm obviously happy to update you as things develop. Okay. Uh, Gary, is it possible to maybe recap on the key uh, aspects of the bid that has been made. <coughs> yeah, no problem. If you give me a second just to... From. <coughs> That's the worst that they're going to file with me. I can never find them. No work. problem. So the, the bids really that we put forward, we, I think we shared the, 
the document that we shared with the Department of Finance. <coughs> so I'll, ru I'll run through really what, what all that covers. You'll be aware of the, the teaching uh, industrial action that's ongoing, so that's, that's a key concern to try and get that resolved. Uh, before we got a, a new minister, um, now that we have a new minister, the understanding is very clear. There's no point in any agreement being settled with teachers unless there's funding to support it, because that's been the problem over the last few years, where we haven't been able to fund pay increases, um, inflationary pay increases, or even incremental contractual increases, or uh, non-teaching staff pay increases. So that's been a big issue, and it's, it's one of the biggest issues that has led to the increase in deficits in, at school level over the last few years. So we're bidding for $148 million for next year. Um, special education now. <coughs> Special education needs is an ongoing pressure, as you'll all be aware of. It's, there's really increasing costs every year, roughly of about 22 million. So we would need next year we would need the 22 million increase for this year, baseline, and that there's likely to be forecast to be about a 22 million increase next year. Um, and that's, there, there is work, the Education Authority, I think, briefed you. They may have touched on this when they were up with you. There, there is some work, further work being done in terms of special education needs to try and get a better understanding of some of the drivers of that spend because it is such an escalating. It, it's always a challenge from my point of view every year, and we're having to bid for resources in year. So we're, we're being upfront about the position in terms of next year. Uh, and. And there, the, the Education Authority reports a number of pressures within their block grant. Now, in the past few years, we haven't funded them for all. We haven't been able to fund them for all the pressures that they have experienced. Now, invariably, that has come through. That has still come through. A lot of those issues have still come through as pressures throughout the year, and we've bid for additional resources. Sometimes been successful, sometimes not. Again, we're just being upfront of what the Education Authority is saying. Their pressures are likely to be for next year. School maintenance. Uh, I think you had a briefing on school maintenance and the, the, the very significant issues out there across the education estate. That's just an ongoing issue. Really, what all we've been able to do is fund the minimum, you know, the real things that might hit the crisis point in terms of health and safety. We always have an agreement with the Education Authority. If there's, uh, if there's anything really significant that crops up, they should engage with us early, and I think between us all we would try and do something. Because obviously, if there's you know, if a wall collapses in a school or whatever, nobody wants that kind of situation. But the reality is, there's a lot of work required across the educational state, and that's tied in as well with the whole discussion around area planning and the capital program and the extent of capital works that can be taken forward in any year. <clears throat> in the last uh, couple of years, we've had additional funding from Confidence of Supply. Now, that was never able to enable us to do additional things. It covered a range of issues around deprivation, really, really enabled us to continue the provision, or the, uh, enabled the sector really to continue with the provision of uh, services around uh, deprivation. And that's, if we, without that, that would essentially require services to be cut. That's the reality. And we were very grateful for it, obviously, in the past couple of years, because at least it enabled us not to have to make some of those difficult decisions. Um, I'm going to pick out some of the big ones here. The voluntary exit scheme. Again, we're bidding for additional an additional 22 million. Now, whether whether all of that will be spent or not, that's the estimate uh, of what could be spent potentially. That would enable the release of maybe 200 teachers, max of 200 teachers, and uh, a number of uh, non-teaching staff as well. Now, uh, it, it's hard to estimate up front what that might be, but there is still, uh, we would definitely put forward the case that there is a need to have a voluntary exit scheme because it allows, it, if you like, it oxygenates the system because it enables schools to make some of the difficult decisions where they no longer require a teacher of a particular subject, for instance. And if there's, uh, across the sector, uh, the Education Authority and schools endeavour not to have to go down the redundancy route. Sometimes it's necessary, but every effort is made to try and, and uh, move staff potentially from one school to another, if need be, 
or if, if staff are willing to go on voluntary exit. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't necessarily mean a significant reduction in the overall teaching course over time because then with demand, curricular demands and uh, demographics quite <coughs> often, there's a need for a teacher of a different subject. So it's, but it still is an important aspect of funding that enables like an oxygenating of the system. Um, and there have actually been significant reduction, leaving aside teaching there, and there have been, there, a lot of teach, teachers have exited the system over time, others have come in. There's been quite significant reductions. For example, the Education Authority, since it was established, uh, have released probably over 800 people, non-teaching staff. So it has really helped in terms of delivering some of the efficiency, efficiencies that are required. Um, the implementation of the SEND framework, I think you're getting probably a detailed briefing on that in the coming weeks, but that is essentially where a new, a new framework would be introduced. Um, this actually fell within the, the transformation projects that I'm, or the, the transformation project that I am SRO for, the review of the common funding scheme. And I have always been supportive of the fact that because this is, this is imposing something new on schools, that it justifies a bid for additional resources. Because one of the complaints, uh, obviously we listen to school principals along the way, and one of the, the concerns they have is that there's more and more imposed on them at times without the additional resources. So I've been supportive of that as a bid moving forward. That will be a recurrent bid moving forward. And in some ways could be described as transformational as well because it will bring about, about a new way of doing things and I think will support early interventions on some of the, the special educational needs of, of children. Delivery of a child care strategy. There's a number of these areas. Delivery of child care strategy, delivery of mental health and emotional well-being and nurture programme. Some of these are issues really that our minister and the executive to some extent as a whole will have to decide, you know, how do they want to tackle some of these issues. They're very important areas. But again, it will be linked to the, the level of funding that's available overall. So some of that's up in the air, I suppose. The child care strategy, there's different uh, approaches that could be taken that would have dif different financial consequences. There would be big financial consequences no matter what option you go for. So they are... <coughs> They are reflected here, it's appropriate that we bid for them, but they are probably to some extent new things and there'll have to be a view taken as to what's affordable overall on an executive level. And let's see, I don't want to get into too much detail in case I'm boring you, but uh, that probably covers some of the main areas. Uh, okay. We also have a rates pressure that actually to some extent came out of the blue after we had put forward our initial bid, uh, the figure there of 11 million is what we were quoted were engaging with the uh, land and property services and that, so we're not quite sure where the figure might land. And I know there's been a discussion at uh, executive level as to, you know, could something be done even in the short term to try and avoid this hit on, on the budget, because either it hits our budget and we're left short, or if it's funded by the department out of the executive's budget, and it hits the executive's budget, so I don't know where that'll go to, but it is, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a pressure for us at this stage. Um, those are some of the main areas. I don't know whether members have any particular yeah, questions. No. And if we take questions on these matters, Gary, are you content to come back to some programme for government issues as well then? Yeah. yeah well, yeah. probably my colleagues will pick up yeah. on the programme no for government issues. Okay. Uh, just, just to start in terms of the, uh, the rates... Uh, that, that you raised there. Um, how, do you have a, an estimated total of what the increase to school rates bill may be? It is that <coughs> 11 million figure at this stage, although we've asked for the detail on a school by school basis. I should emphasise this doesn't hit individual <coughs> schools' budgets. The, uh, the cost is picked up by the Education Authority, so it hits, it hits our budget overall, okay. and that's why it's highlighted as a pressure now. So the schools bit. aren't going to see a, a shock no, to their no. budget in the... In the, the Education Authority the picks up the tab for controlled and maintained schools and, and voluntary grammars uh, are, are exempt on the whole, so okay. not a direct hit there. But it obviously be, could but be a, quite a, a significant, significant shock to the department budget yeah. then? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and you have no indication as to how exactly that's going to be met at this stage? No. No. Okay. That, that is more a discussion at executive level, I mean... We, okay. 
Well, look, as we know, we're obviously in a, a, a serious situation. Um, the situation has been referred to a financial crisis previously. Do, do you believe that there is a financial crisis for education? I think it's widely recognised. There's very significant financial strain right across the sector. Um, I try to be optimistic at this time of the year and hope for the best in terms of what might be agreed in terms of a budget. At the end of the day, no matter what is agreed, it's probably still going to require some challenging decisions to be made. Um, up until you know, the last few years when there have been very challenging budgets given to us, we've tried to keep the focus on frontline delivery, you know, on children and young people and, and schools, early years and youth. That, I imagine, will continue to be our key focus, but it, it is challenging. And uh, I suppose we'll, we'll have to manage whatever comes through, but we're hopeful that uh, you know, some of the significant pressures that, that we've highlighted will be met. You know, there's obviously areas that have highlighted there that you know it's an executive view to some extent for what is taken forward and to what extent things are taken forward and when they're taken forward such as the child care strategy and other issues. Um, but it's a matter of waiting and seeing what, what the budget looks like. OK. Before I bring members in, just <coughs> at, at the high level on resource and capital, just to check my understanding is correct in terms of total bids and therefore I presume some indication of the scale of the pressures that you're facing on, yeah. on resource. The department is seeking $353 million for 2021. No, we're actually seeking, uh, let's see, I don't know whether it was in that paper that we shared with. We're seeking, uh, taking account of some additional items that were reflected in the NDNA agreement. It's actually £427 million we have bid for for next year. Okay. It's taking account of everything. Now, some of the, okay. there's obviously discussions going on in terms of some of the detail within the NDNA agreement and whether that can be taken forward in the short term or perhaps longer term. Increasing to 570 million in 21-22, and what appears to be 716 million in 22-23 yes. to 23 compared yeah. to the 19-20 baseline. Yeah. 716 million additional, yeah. and you believe that that will be allocated? Uh, well, as I understand it, it's going to be. A, it's likely only to be a one-year budget anyway. That will be announced by the Chancellor. So our focus, I suppose, this stage is on next year and trying to maximise the extent of the bids that could be met, and then decisions will have to be taken in terms of prioritisation. Okay. In terms of capital increase, you're seeking compared to 1920 um, for 2021. Uh, well, sorry, 21 to 22 is going to be 80 million <coughs> extra, and then for 22 to 23, 120 million extra. Yeah. Uh, as well as reprofiling of the Fresh Start capital. Um, yeah. Can can the department actually spend that additional money in capital? Uh, yeah, well, the, the bids were submitted, so the understanding is that the department could spend it. There's always capital uh, can be difficult to manage because it depends on uh, how quickly some of the major schemes can move and whether the, invariably there are timing issues there. If issues are identified early enough a year, quite quite often money can be reallocated down to minor works. Um, one of the big issues, as you mentioned, is the flexibility around the Fresh Start Agreement money, which we're still seeking, and the Department of Finance is still seeking an answer from Treasury on that. Because that, that obviously has an impact on quite a number of projects. Okay. We would want the flexibility in that rather than losing it. Because if we lost that money, it would have a significant impact on all other capital. Okay. But in, in total, in three years' time, you're not far off a, a billion pounds of mm -hmm. additional money for the department being requested. Yeah. I mean, okay, that's the finance side of it, how, how realistic is that and if, if you don't receive that, what type of radical <coughs> overhaul of education is, is needed alternatively? Well, we would have to, again, the focus would be, as we've done in previous years, we, we develop a budget strategy and that, but it, it's not easy. Um, really the only areas that the Minister would probably have to consider in conjunction with executive colleagues are those new areas that have been identified that I've referred to. Um, to actually start to cut other areas invariably hits those at the front line, children, 
young people, and that's the that has always been the challenge for for this department, because so much of our expenditure on the resource side is linked to staffing costs, and therefore the, there's not a lot of flexibility there, and invariably you're you're either having to make people redundant, stop sir stop quite critical services that are having significant impact on uh, the you know the educational welfare of children and young people. So we. Uh, in the, up until now, when we didn't have a minister, we highlighted some of those areas really as areas that require a political decision because it felt it, it felt too heavy for an accounting officer to have to make a decision <coughs> to make cuts to services that are so critical to children and young people. So I, I, we would, if we didn't get a significant portion of what we're seeking here, we'd be in that position again. That's the reality. And when when will the finance minister be meeting the chancellor? I don't know. I wasn't given a date, but he did indicate he'd be engaging again. I think he's he's wanting to complete all of his bilaterals with the executive ministers first. Okay, and it suggests that the independent review of education ought to be wide ranging and mm. urgent. Yeah, are there any indications as to when that will be initiated? Not at this stage. No, the minister will take a view on that in due course. Okay, uh, we have been briefing him on. Uh, the work that has already been taken forward under the, the education transformation programme, some of which falls to me as well. So, uh, obviously, that that may well impact on any views that are taken on a wider review. In that transformation programme is tinkering at the edges of yeah, well, billion pounds additional resource. Yeah, yeah. There was okay. never an awful lot of money to take it forward, but there, there has been a fair bit of work. Okay, I'll bring in the members. Thanks very much, Gary. Uh, yeah. Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, uh, Gary, for your uh, presentation and insight into some of the challenges. I've noted that, that throughout your uh, presentation with us, you've said continually that there is a requirement for challenges and decisions to be made at the time ahead. Well, I'm sure you're very well aware, as the members of this committee are, and my colleagues, that uh, there has been challenges, this challenging decisions made within the schools for the last number of years yeah. as a result of the continued cuts and severe financial pressures burdened on principals. Uh, within schools to manage uh, their resources. Uh, that stress has continued over the last number of years, and I'm worried that that <coughs> is going to worsen uh, as a result of what lies ahead. Uh, and I think that while, while I'm speaking on it, a huge tribute to the many principals out there who have managed in these circumstances over the last number of years, and also to the teachers who unfortunately are on, uh, uh, involved in this action, uh, who don't want to be but feel that they have no choice simply because they are not getting what they are rightfully entitled to. But in terms of the £148 million for teachers and non-teachers pay, uh, just if, if teachers had a, have received the equivalent of the public sector pay award since 2015-16, would they have more or less money now? And um, was it an advantage to the Department of Education not to pay teachers until now? Was there any advantage for this delay? And, so basically, well, would there be more money or less money? Uh, well, they, would, they obviously would have got more money if they if they had uh, received rises in line with public sector pay policy. But the negotiations have been ongoing for that period of time, and at least at this point, there seems to be agreement on principle, subject to funding. Um, now, again, whatever might be agreed with teachers, it's probably linked as well to whatever budget settlement we get. You know, there's elements of, of that make up that 148 million. 68 million would hopefully settle uh, the pay dispute for uh, 16, 17, and uh, sorry, 17, 18, 16, 17, and 17, 18, uh, and uh, included within the 148 million would be an, a one percent increase for this year and next year. So whether those w may have to be decoupled, I don't know. Um, the, yeah. So in answer to your question, yes, teachers would have been better off if they'd got the one percent. But then negotiations have been ongoing that would actually deliver, deliver better than that, based on what the agreement in principle is at the moment for those two years. Yeah, and, and given the disruption that this has undoubtedly caused over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And that we're in the middle of this discussion now about issuing what is rightfully the entitlement of teachers. But what has been the benefit of this entire mess to the Department of Education by withholding what is rightfully the entitlement of teachers? 
I haven't been involved in the negotiation process. I mean, I think, it's been, I think there have been issues probably on both sides, and there has probably been that need for the, the level of engagement and negotiation with the unions to, to get to the point where they've got to now. But it wasn't, as I understand, it wasn't just pay issues. There were other issues as well. So I think it's been a meaningful engagement with all of the, the unions, and it's, it's helpful that agreement in principle has, has been reached at least at this stage. And how, do you think that this whole process has been handled effectively over the last few years? Well, I haven't been involved in it, so I wouldn't want to comment on that. analysis of the delays and the disruption that has caused the schools, when ultimately now we're sitting where we should have been a number of years ago? Well, my role is really to, 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 get, to get the information from a finance perspective and make sure that I'm bidding for the required resources, so I wouldn't want to comment on the process. Okay. The £5 million on teachers' redundancy, why, why is that so little? Why is that figure so low? 22. 22, yeah, but it says 2016 the Department of Education spent £5 million on teachers' redundancy. Oh, sorry, you're looking at the totals? Sorry, what, what are you referring to? Yeah. Uh, in 2016, the Department of Education spent £5 million on teachers' redundancy. Yes. So I'm, I'm wondering why that figure was so low then. Well, the split of the £22 million, for instance, for next year in terms mm -hmm. of uh, potential voluntary exits is about £7 million for teaching and about £15 million for non-teaching. So, uh, the £5 million would have been what was delivered in that particular year against a budget probably of about £7 million. And does the non-teaching involve classroom assistance? Yes. Okay. Um, how many? Yeah. How many classroom assistants? Uh, I can, don't think we have a figure with us of potential. Or do we have a figure of potential? <coughs> we don't have a breakdown of classroom assistants, but we can certainly come back to it. That would be helpful because if 7 million is on teaching oh, yeah. and you expect that to be 200 teachers um, and the balance for non teaching is 15 million, notwithstanding the fact that there may be other. Well, if a staff member in that, I guess there could be a concern that that would be quite a significant number of classroom assistants. Well, Why would that the, be the case if the it 15 is? million could potentially release up to 360 non teaching staff? Now, that could be a whole range of staff, so it wouldn't all be classroom assistants. We don't have the breakdown what that may, might be, but again, they, these are only estimates. This is, this is what's estimated could happen next year. Um, but the reality is, as we all know, because there have been a lot of exits in the past, the numbers coming forward, it's dependent on who is interested in, in leaving voluntarily. So the numbers be, could well be below it, that. It would be helpful to get a breakdown of that non-teaching staff, given the significance of some of the rules yeah. within that uh, group of people. Daniel, do uh, you want to come back in there? Yeah, uh, yeah. Ju just in terms of the voluntary exit scheme. Yeah. Um, it will, uh, just to emphasise, it will be an estimate of what is potentially yeah. possible. I don't know whether it would be helpful for us to maybe provide you with the figures of the numbers of non of classroom assistance, assistance, for instance, that have gone uh, that went last year, just to mm. give you mm. an illustration. But we yep. can certainly we can give you an estimate. That would be helpful. Thank yeah. you. Uh, the 12 million uh, for uh, sorry, more than half of the mm -hmm. of the amount allocated for a voluntary exit scheme has been surrendered in 1920. So mm. why why is that figure so high, or what's the reason behind that? I think, as I say, it's just uh, because there have been so many exits over the last few years, it's very difficult to estimate the interest that there will be in a voluntary exit scheme, and it varies you know, each year. Uh, that's really the only explanation I can give. You are dependent on people wanting to leave the system. These people aren't being forced. There's no compulsory redundancy. And is there anything you'd do differently, given that there's £12 million being surrendered back to the Department of Finance? Well, the department does, uh, the department's workforce side does liaise very closely with the education authority early in the year and even in advance of the year to try and get fairly you know, robust figures from, uh, it will be coming from the education authority primarily, but we try to get robust figures at the start of the year. But again, it, it is dependent on that. A number of people will put their names forward and perhaps not, you know, take the, the things through right, you know, may, may not follow it through to actually leave. But they may express an interest at the start, so it's difficult to assess. Okay, uh, Chair, if you just give me an hour, a few moments. Brief, yeah, brief yeah. follow up. Uh, in terms of the uh, childcare strategy, um, the 15 million uh, that's allocated, mm -hmm. um, I'm just, just um, 
looking at item three on the, to bring all preschool down to 12.5, wrap around 17.5 hours child care. So it's my thinking that this will reduce the educational element of the current provision. Is that, is that right? I think, that's only, I think that's only one option. Yeah, yeah. it's an option, but is that considered. is that something that is noted in considering that option? Because that would have a detrimental impact on the current All those All those issues would be considered. It's really just, I suppose, what we, we, we wanted to bid for a resource as part of our bidding strategy. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to know. It would depend on what decisions were made and what option uh, is chosen. But there would be more, more work and more discussion around that. And again, it's whether, whether we could spend even 15 next year, so a lot of that is a bit up in the air, but I think it's right nonetheless that we bid for issues like that. Bring other m members in, yeah. Daniel, but you yeah. can bring back in if, if needs be. Very briefly before I do, on the, on the voluntary um, severance, wh why, why is there a system, why in our system can we um, offer voluntary severance to so many teaching and non-teaching staff? Uh, well, I think it, it is linked to some of the challenges that you refer to at school level. Where, um, I mean, obviously you would know you will know that I have written out to schools over the last few years, and, and as a matter of process, write out to schools to inform them of their budgets at the start of each year. And I emphasise the importance of good financial management, as as I need to do in my role, notwithstanding the fact that I recognise the pressures that uh, school leaders are under. But when they're when Boards of Governors are seeking to make difficult decisions on living within budget. Quite often that does require the release of staff. So the voluntary exit scheme is there to facilitate some of that decision making at school level uh, uh, and also to enable Boards of Governors to make the right decisions that, that they need to make in terms of the, the subject leads or whatever that they need in a school. And also for non-teaching staff it allows that uh, Oxygen in the system, I suppose, where, where some people are not required for the purposes that they were previously. I think it's an area of interest we'd, we'd probably like to come back to or ask more questions. Yeah. As far as I can see, and this is maybe a slightly vulgar analysis, but we either have too many teaching and non-teaching staff, or are we reducing schools below capacity mm -hmm. on, on on that staffing element? I'll stop there if I need to get other members in. Robbie Butler? Yeah, just yeah. On, on this note, is that okay, Chair? Yeah, of course, the, yeah, go ahead. I, find, yeah. I find this one actually quite uh, intriguing because um, does it constitute good value for money that, that there is such a scheme uh, there, given the reasons that you've suggested um, and some of the explanations? Um, we've, we've, we've spoke to some of the uh, bodies that represent teachers and there isn't a high churn. Mm -hmm. It is a profession which has a good retention, mm -hmm. yep. and so we have a, perhaps an aging population in our teachers and so on. So, is is it is it perhaps a strategic sort of oversight, or is it is it just one of those unmanageable difficulties because we don't have that long term vision for education? Um, and then, secondly, I think that the, uh, both Chris and Daniel have picked this out in terms of the the disparity in the figures between t teaching staff and non teaching staff. Is that is there not the retention issues with non-teaching staff? Would, would that be in the mix of the breakdown of, of why there seems to be a bigger churn there? And finally, on, on the, the voluntary exit stuff, the, the money that went back last year, the £12 million, pounds, so the, budget, the, the anticipated budget for this year is 22. Any underspend, can it be reprofiled as opposed to going back to the Department no, of Finance? No, it's ranked pounds. Well? Mm. Okay. pounds, yeah. Uh, I suppose, just to, by way of context, there would be about roughly about 20,000 teachers as compared to about 44,000 non-teaching staff, so that explains to some extent the difference in numbers there. Um, I think it's, it's the nature of the education sector that does require, you know, a lot depends on the requirements of the curriculum and the individual pupils in any given year, and that impacts on the, the you know, the the subject leads, etc., that you require in any year. So it allows some of that flexibility at school level to take place. And uh, non-teaching staff as well, it, it enables, and that, that covers quite a range. I mean, I don't know who all, you know, you, you maybe have people involved in providing school meals, um, people employed linked to transport, or, you know, it's a whole raft of areas. So it just allows that kind of flexibility within the system to deal with some of the pressures and so that schools in particular do not feel bound to a particular staffing structure that may not work for them moving forward. 
But, but uh, the point being that the, the, the curriculum that I understand wouldn't be as flexible as maybe it sound, you make it mm. sound in, because there are difficulties with changing mm. the curriculum and there's things that we, we talk about in here. So I'm, thinking, I'm struggling to understand the concept of a changing curriculum on an annual basis, creating the environment where uh, redundancy is an option mm. or, or, or perhaps having to move teachers on. So. Yeah. Um, I don't want to stray too much into my colleagues' territory. It might be better if, uh, if perhaps he came back with some information. That would be Mark Bailey's side. Yeah. Um, obviously, I, I have a bidding strategy here, and it makes sense yeah. from, from our point of view to bid as a department for this. Yeah. Uh, it's probably it's, it's a valid question to ask: Is this valid for value for money? And probably that question needs to be asked every year to ensure that we are, you know, the system is getting value <coughs> for, money for that. Jim, <coughs> I have a second question on another note. Is that okay? If we, yeah, if we keep it brief, can you get as yeah. many members in as I can? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, secondly, on the the uh, mental health framework and the mm -hmm. ten million pounds, is that first of all, is that per annum or is that is yes. that okay? Um, so it's per annum for three years. Um, is there any anticipated pressures within the financial aspects with regard to the delivery of the framework this year? So has there been any risk assessment done on any? Um, failure for finance to stack up with the delivery of this framework by, I think, by December, we've been told, uh, that'll be signed off uh, this year. And could you provide a breakdown for the, the £10 million pounds over those three, three years? Uh, I don't, don't know that we have any of that information with us. We can come back on that. OK. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think maybe colleagues from Workforce Health and uh, Wellbeing Framework were here last week, and I think mm -hmm. they have agreed to write to the committee on specific areas, so we'll ask them to include that detail as well. Okay. And again, this is an area I think that probably will also require a bit of an executive discussion because it's, it's not just education, but yeah, we'll come back okay. with more detail. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Morris Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my my issue is on childcare and the review of the childcare strategy. Uh, has the department identified how it's going to take the childcare strategy forward? Uh, is there any indication of the costs? And what will the target number of hours available? And if not, assuming it isn't, when will that information and those costs be available? Uh, am I, I think I'm right in assuming that you may be getting a more detailed briefing from colleagues on that. Maybe next, next week. Next Wednesday, there's a session on early years in childcare. So if you, uh, I don't, don't mean to be rude in that response, but it might be better if you waited to, to get that detailed briefing. I mean, obviously, we have uh, a bid for resources based on what might be feasible from next year. And again, from a budgeting strategy point of view, that made sense to get some to get a flag up, really, that, that it's an issue. Okay. One week, quick one. Yeah, go ahead, Morris. And it's a 2.5 million bid for nurture. Is that to cover the, the current signature project which covers 31 schools, or is it a broader figure for a wider number of schools? That, that would be to fund a wider. <coughs> and again, it's not. Uh, it's probably not fully thought through yet exactly what that, that, that would be, but it is to provide something wider. Yeah. And is that budget bad enough to widen it out? Well, I suppose we, we try to construct bids as realistic as possible. There's, there's no point in us going in too high on certain bids if we feel that it, uh, when something is kicking off new that we may not be able to spend that level. So I think it's a reasonable assumption for the, for the coming year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Robin Newton. Thank you, Chair. Welcome, Gary, and his, his, his colleagues to the meeting. And uh, I have to say I, I'm extremely pleased to see it. Such an ambitious bid, I think it's to be commended. And we often talk about the um, the cost of education uh, rather than investment in, in education. So uh, let's see where it all goes. Can I return to the twenty-two million, Gary? Mm -hmm. Just just a wee bit. And that's a nice word that you knew use oxygenate mm -hmm. the. Yes, uh, that really just means cheaper teachers, doesn't it? Uh, well, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Even partially. Um, well, I think. Well, I, mean, I, I, I understand what you're trying to do. That teachers uh, who move on. Yeah, I think investment. Younger teachers come yeah. in. They're a, a different cost level to the school, so therefore there's a budget savings. I don't know that that would be the main driver. The investing in the teacher workforce was probably more focused on that, where it was giving the opportunity for teachers sort of at, at near the end of their teaching career to consider leaving to enable younger, newly trained teachers to come in. Come in. 
But in terms of the voluntary exit scheme, I think it's wider than that. It is, as I've, as I've described, it's just an area <coughs> those difficult decisions to be made at school level. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, it really was uh, only sort of occurred to me. Chair, in terms of uh, the 22 million, does that also include the teachers in the SEN schools? Is that, are they involved in that redundancy? Yeah, we'll cover, cover all teachers. Yes. All teaching staff, yeah. and so some of those classroom assistants would also be involved in our yeah. special needs yeah. schools. Um, I mean, obviously, business needs have to come into any decisions when it comes to voluntary access. Yes. Although part, I think part of the problem in the past few years, the Education Authority in particular, I mean, obviously we have been putting them under pressure, as is our role to, to ensure there's good value across the sector to make significant efficiency savings. So it has been challenging from the Education Authority's point of view because num you know, the numbers had to reduce in order for savings to be made. And I think part of the problem now that the Chief Executive is facing is, is maybe looking at areas where there might be gaps from a business need point of view and having to look at that. So there are, there's big challenges around this because, it's yes, it's probably back to your original point, there is an element where there's an efficiency driver to this. But I think the more important driver is making sure that the right people are in the right places to deliver the best for the children. Okay. Uh, it must be a big challenge to replace you know, redundant uh, special needs teachers and indeed classroom assistants in, in, mm. in that area, whilst the sector are arguing about um, mm -hmm. or they feel they are not being supported adequately yeah. at this moment in time? Well, uh, the Education Authority also makes use of the transfer redundancy scheme, which enables some movement across schools of individuals, so uh, where, there, where there's an interest by some staff in taking voluntary exit, uh, there can be movement across schools so, so that the needs are still met, hopefully, depending on the skills that are required. It, it is tricky to handle, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why quite often the last few years the spend has been a bit below what was anticipated. But I, I still think it's a good thing from a value for money per perspective to you know, bid for the resource. We, we can't hold on to the money if we don't spend it anyway. And I, as long as it's released early enough in the year, um, I presume the exchequer can use it. Right. Just going in on the uh, 10 million for educational underachievement, mm -hmm. how would you anticipate that 10 million being spent if you're successful? Again, that was put forward as part of our bidding strategy. There wouldn't be a lot, uh, well, I, I'm not briefed on a lot of the underpinning detail. I think, again, that is probably a dis an executive discussion that needs to take place once budgets are agreed. Uh, it's an important area, and it's an important area for the executive to consider. Uh, whatever's taken forward will depend on, on the budget settlement, I would imagine, as well, uh, other than what can be taken forward within existing resources. So I don't have, uh, I don't, I'm not even sure whether we, do we have much detail on that that we could get from policy? Yeah, I think it's really, take the, the, the aspiration would be to sort of further develop some of the work that's already been done and, and give it new impetus. So there's a, there is a good aspiration behind it, but again, I think it will depend on what resources become available. My, my understanding is that it will be used in some degree to refresh the extended schools programme, which is now to be called Partners in yeah. Education. Is, mm. Alison, is that something yes. you want to comment on? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, we, we have... Um, I mean, the extended schools programme um, is 14 years old now, so it's it, there is a, a, an opportune moment to... Look at that program afresh. Um, look at the lessons that have been learned from some of our other programs, um, and we'd really like to improve the offer. Um, but at the moment, that's a paper that's with the minister for consideration, um, and we've been invited back um, in due course to give the committee a more detailed brief on. That. Robin, if you don't mind, okay, I'll join me for a second as yeah. well. So the, the extended some of the challenges with regard to the extended schools is um, monitoring or observing, accounting for precisely what the, the funding goes towards um, once no. it's received by the schools? No, um, No, we have a very okay. um, comprehensive programme of accounting for extended schools, actually, and I was going to come to it when we came to PFG, but the, there's a report published by the EA okay. annually, and we have a, a 
sophisticated Northern in Ireland extended schools in information system that the schools upload their action plans to and then would um, give us information on what's been achieved. So. Might be something to come back to in, in even more detail down the line. Do you want back in, Robin? Or? No, I'm, yeah. I'm happy, Chair, and uh, your final remarks about coming back to it at a later stage. Yeah, happy enough. And with that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Catherine Kelly? Uh, thank you, Dwayne, for your presentation. Um, I'm going to bring it back again to child care. Um, it's something that is in crisis across the north, and I think most of us are aware that it is. Um, and I suppose if we're getting more of a, an updated briefing next week, um, I'm just going to make a comment, um, and that is on the fact that when we talk about child care, we shouldn't talk about it as child minding or, you know, fill in a space um, for while a parent is, is working. It should be about the education of the child. Um, and I think that there should be a particular focus on that when we're talking about or looking at what scheme um, within the child care strategy um, it will end up being. Um, <coughs> particularly in the area that I live in, um, in West Throne, but um, Fermanagh and Oma District Council area has the littlest provision. Um, and it's just something that um, we need to tackle very, very soon. Um, and I think that if anyone is in any doubt, they should um, take a read at Employers for Child Care's survey in 2019. Um, and it, it makes shocking reading. Um, just a question on, can you advise, this is on special educational needs, can you advise how the 44 million for special educational needs would be broken down, um, and will this address the lengthy delays in the statement in times? Uh, I think we can answer the first question. Um, the estimates we've got from the, or the forecast spend we've got from the Education Authority would indicate that about 9 million would go in special schools, 16 million then in mainstream schools, and 12 million people support and seven million on same transport costs. So that's the best estimate at this stage. Uh, I don't know that I could answer your second question. Uh, all I would refer to again is that I know that as part of the uh, draft recovery plan, thinking that the education authority is doing, that special educational needs is one particular area they'll be looking at. Uh, and certainly, I presume that would be the, the aspiration. Mm. Uh, Okay, thank you. Karen Mullen, Deputy Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for the uh, presentation again. It's been a short couple of weeks, so we appreciate you coming back out. Back to Ritz, um, can I ask, is it the case that private B aimed schools can register for charitable status and then these private schools then are afforded relief, Ritz relief or exemption? Uh, I, as I understand it, for those type of schools, it, it depends on how, there's a number of factors, it depends on how the, the school was originally established, and I suppose any school could make a case for becoming a charity. Um, that said, I don't know whether, Susan, you can give any more details on voluntary grammars generally. No, I think it does in the individual school set up, on whether they're mm. the trustees, and whether yeah. it can be classified as a charity for most people and other status as well. And some of those schools may have other properties that aren't directly linked to the provision of education for children that they may have to pay rates on, but in terms of the normal provision of education services, the normal exam. Right. Um, on the schools' deficits, in 2014, the number of schools in deficit has, has since doubled, more than doubled, um, and the surplus position has fallen by nearly 17 million. So, would the £60 million pound figure uh, cited it begin to reverse that trend? Yeah, that's the intention, uh, and that's really why we submitted that bid. You know, it, just to try and stabilise the system, 60 cumulatively for three years. Uh, there's no way around it. There just hasn't been enough money going in through the aggregated schools budget over the last number of years. And on Monday, the finance minister announced an extra £10 million pound for education, do mm -hmm. we know for the department where that yes. will be allocated to? We have a break there. Yeah. Um, just it. under one million will go towards SEN. That um, meets the full SEN pressures for this year. About just over one million will go towards EU exit costs within the Education Authority. And then the balance will address the existing pressures within the Education Authority as well. 
Great. And if we're going to come back to uh, extended schools under PFG, I'll keep me all our questions. Is that okay. William Humphrey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Gary, for the presentation. Yeah. Gary, could just ask, in terms of the challenges that you've set out, which are huge, mm -hmm. and the, the bid this year of 427 million, rising to 570 next year and 716 in the following year, um, given the challenges uh, that are faced by the Department, in terms of economies of scale and savings, budgetary planning, costs, the opportunity cost, what would the picture be if we'd one education system in Northern Ireland? Uh, I suppose that the reality would be it probably would be cheaper to run. There's no question about that. But uh, we are where we are. As, as you know, as officials, we have to develop a budget strategy for the minister's consideration based on where we are. But I suppose even if you were to consider, and I don't know where the independent review thinking might go to on that, but. If you were to consider significant transformation of the sector, it will always take time. And even in, uh, as you look, you've been briefed by other colleagues in terms of area planning, it doesn't necessarily the, the focus of area planning is not necessarily on getting a cheaper way of doing things; it's getting a better way for the for the youngsters, you know, a better way of educating children. And, and <clears throat> so, it's not it's not a straightforward sector in many ways, but. Uh, any any significant transformation would take quite a bit of time. How long do you think? Well, you would be looking certainly medium to longer term. I mean, the, the work that we, the work that I've been leading on the review of the common funding scheme, for instance, in some ways, and you know, some of you are probably aware of what of the thinking uh, that we've been putting into that. Some of it would almost feel like you're tinkering at the edges. Because, but we're still listening to principals and boards of governors in terms of the issues that matter to them. Um, I suppose a lot of what you're talking about is linked to area planning as well, and it's the challenges around area planning, and obviously there, there is a significant drive to get things moving quicker, both within the department and with the education authority, but it's the, it's the local challenges that, that are faced every time decision, difficult decisions have to be made. Can I just return to the, the issue that Mr Bradley raised about nurture units? Um, up to this point there have been 31 uh, primary schools in the signature project of pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, was your answer suggesting that the £2.5 million pounds that had been allocated would now go across all the primary schools? I'm wondering as a colleague better? I think, I think nurture units are also on the schedule for next Wednesday. Um, not part of my session, but with that... Right. Next Wednesday is going to be revelation. It is, <laughs> yeah. Well, can, I, can, I, can I just make the point then, before we get to next Wednesday? If the department thinks that £2.5 million over 31 projects can be spread, the same amount of money can be spread over all primary schools in Northern Ireland, that will be nowhere near enough to make an impact. In fact, the department will not be serious if that if it makes that decision, uh, and I don't think any member around this table would agree to that. How on earth could could you possibly suggest that two point five million pounds, when there's no increase in that from what I see here, which is which is spread over thirty one schools, could then be spread to have an impact over hundreds of schools? That is a nonsense. Just make that point. In terms of the um, school maintenance and new build. Uh, you, you didn't touch on figures for those, I suppose. You, you, you probably, uh, that comes down to, uh, or does it come down to the professional judgment of those who go into schools and um, assess the need in terms of maintenance and in terms of new build? Yeah. How does that work in the department? How do, you, how do you get to the top of the league in terms of getting this work done? My colleague Philip Irwin would be better informed right. on that. I don't, don't want to tread on his. I mean, obviously, yeah. And I mean, work all capital works are and maintenance are prioritised. So, but there are different criteria. I, I wouldn't be informed enough on that side to give you a meaningful answer. Probably better. I don't know whether Philip's coming out or if you want me to get Philip to come back okay, to you on that. Just, just finally, sir. In terms of. Um, Yes, if you, if you could come back, that would be helpful. Yeah, um, in terms of the, the, the issue around hard-to-reach communities, educational payment, 
and those issues. Does the department work sufficiently well with the EEA and other government departments on that issue to ensure that you know that money is targeted mm -hmm. in the way that it could and should be? Uh, well, I'm not directly involved, but <coughs> I, I would have enough dealings with the Education Authority and, and with colleagues within the department. <coughs> and I, I believe there is that level of joint upness across the, the system, and it's obviously critical. So, yes. And therefore, just finally then, on that, if there is that level of joint upness, do you believe it's there? Do they, those other departments, for example, communities might be, do they bring any money to the table to help? Uh, I don't know the detail, but yes, it does. It does happen that there's agreements between departments where there's joint funding of certain projects. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And obviously, it's depending on the availability of funding. Quite often, another department will be bidding in the way that we're bidding, in order to, to deliver something that requires joined up working. Okay, thanks. Okay, Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Gary, and your colleagues for coming to meet us this morning. Um, there's no mention of the investing in the teaching workforce scheme, and I'm referencing Simon Doyle's article in the Irish News today. Why is this? Does the department not think it was successful? It was about bringing newly qualified teachers into the into permanent roles, and you've already used the term, as William has referenced already, oxygenating the system. Can this not be looked at again? Uh, that would be a matter for the, the minister to consider. Uh, I couldn't comment on that. I know that he would he would have been supportive of it in the past, so it may well be considered again. But again, a lot of it depends on funding. Okay, thank you. Um, 0.7 million for Ulster Scots and the Irish language. Mm. Um, a token figure. Given the cost of the failure of the collapse of these institutions for three years, mm. um, do you feel that that paltry figure is adequate? Uh, again, as part of a budgeting strategy, we had to assess what would be reasonable to bid for, for next year in particular. And th that cost essentially would cover the establishment of uh, another arm's length body to coordinate that work. Um, and as part of the NDNA agreement. So it, it was deemed to be a prudent bid at this stage, given that perhaps there needs to be more clarity around what would actually be taken forward. Okay, thank you. Um, emotional wellbeing uh, framework. Officials previously advised framework won't be ready until after Christmas, so why bid for 10 million in the year? Um, yeah. We're all aware of the emotional and mental health challenges facing young people. Um, are there any plans to add in additional, additional counselling and support in post primary schools? Um, given the waiting list <coughs> for services? I couldn't comment on detail. I don't think we have. Um, we can come back on that. In terms of resource pressures, school maintenance, uh, there's 6.5 million figure per annum over each of the next three years. Recently, committee were advised of a 400 million backlog. How do those figures marry? The 6.5 million we're bidding for additional resource in addition to what the Education Authority has given to cover that. So the, the budget in the last few years has been about 18 million. So we're, uh, the Education Authority has assessed in terms of dealing with critical health and safety issues. They would need more than the 18 million, so the 6.5 reflects a, a higher bid overall. Um, yes, it would be better if more money could be allocated to, to take forward a lot of school maintenance, more substantial school maintenance. But across the sector, we and the Education Authority have been having to manage the kinds of budgets that we've been given. So it has to be a realistic budget included there, and we have been quite firm that the Education Authority has to live within that budget, but we recognise moving forward that they need at least 6.5 million more, so that's what that reflects. Uh, and yes, I agree, to some extent it is only chipping at the edges of, of the problem, but there has to be a realism in budget planning too, and that's part of the challenge that we've faced in recent years. So, so Justin, so even with that additional allocation, the Department of Education and the Education Authority's extent of capacity with regards to school maintenance at this moment in time is to avoid critical health and safety issues mm. and no more. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that has been the reality. Um, uh, obviously, additional resource would help everything. You know, would help the education authority substantially, but we're we're trying to be realistic here. So the financial crisis extends to a, a state crisis as well, then. And it's not quite as straightforward because it's tied in with whatever capital works will take place as well. So it's part of a wider view, really linked to to your question about the how decisions are made and prioritisation. Okay. Justin, any other follow-up there? Content? Okay. Uh, Daniel, very brief follow-up. Yep. Yeah, uh, I'm just looking, I'm scrolling through a few things here, and I see that uh, there's uh, there's a note on here that says there has been, in real terms, a reduction of £229 million, which is 12% in the DE's resource budget between 2010-11 and 2018-19. So what uh, is the real-term funding loss to school budgets over the same term? And how has people numbers risen over that period? Uh, yes, pupil numbers have risen. I think it's over the same period by about uh, seventeen thousand. Um, so there would have been a real ter uh, sort of an inflationary increase that wasn't funded of about thirteen or fourteen percent. The increase from memory in terms of all additional allocations to school, I think, was three or four percent. So there was quite a significant shortfall there, and. I suppose to bear in mind as well that some of the increases that have been allocated over those years have actually been to cover increased costs, such as national insurance and, uh, and other costs that have been imposed on schools. Uh, now, thankfully, for example, this year there was the increased uh, pension contribution cost, and we were able to secure the funding for that. So even this year, whilst it looked like we were giving a reasonable amount more to schools, it was actually to cover that pension cost largely, apart from seven million that uh, we agreed as part of the budget strategy we'd be given to schools to ensure that they, they would more, no school really should be any worse off than the previous year in terms of the uh, amount of funding per pupil. Okay. okay. Just, uh, Very briefly, briefly, yeah. In terms of deficits, there's been some comments made by colleagues around the table in relation to it, uh, and I'm aware of quite a number of schools, even within my own constituency, that are in a significant defi deficit. Yeah. Uh, in terms of figures, and I don't expect you to list them off, but for, uh, from your knowledge, mm -hmm. what is the highest level of deficit in any particular school? In other words, have they ex how many schools have exceeded a deficit of a million pounds? Uh, I don't know, that I would know that off the top of my head. Other than that the number is probably increasing in recent years, but we can come back with that information. Yeah, that's an important point. Just so yeah. Okay. Now, obviously, just to make sorry, to yeah. just to make one general point, from an awareness point of view, ultimately the education authority has to pick up the tab of a school is in deficit in the year, and that's part of the challenges that they face as well, and it's one of the reasons why we've been working closely with the education authority <coughs> to make sure. Uh, that there is robust financial management across the sector, and that's not to uh, be disparaging to school leaders in any way. It's just so it, it helps me when I am bidding for resources if I can give an assurance that everything is being done across the sector, that schools have gone as far as they can go. But it's never been uh, the message has never been trying to push schools over the edge. It's just getting that assurance that everybody's doing what they can do. Okay, just finally on. Um Budget items, and Gary, mm -hmm. uh, will the Education Authority and the Department of Education close 2019-20 overspent, and if so, by how much for both? At this stage, uh, I, I can't give a definite figure, but at this stage, and we're grateful for the additional money that we've got in year, but the Education Authority would still be forecasting an overspend of potentially 28 million or thereabouts. Now that may not be the actual overspend for the department because there's other factors come into play come the, the end of the year, but there's still a risk around that. Have you had an approximate idea of what the overspend will be for the department? Well, the, the department itself won't be overspent, but quite often the, uh, the, what is reflected as an education authority overspend will reduce when all factors are taken into account, maybe where the department has a, a small easements or whatever. So the main Usually overspend is the education authority then, yeah. Okay, and what what is the consequence of that? Uh, well, the audit office hasn't qualified the education authorities counts over the last number of years, and there's I think even they would recognise the strains in the system. So they and they recognise that between the department and the education authority and schools, everything is being done to manage the position as well as as they can. 
So that, that has been helpful in, in one respect. So in terms of consequence, perhaps this year more than other years because of the pressures on Northern, the Northern Ireland block, it may be more significant. I don't know. I suppose it depends on where every department lands come the end of the year. Will it require an excess vote in the Assembly? No, uh, no, it, no it hasn't. Okay. Chair, can I make a very brief Very, very answer? brief, Daniel, yeah. Uh, it's just, the, you, you've mentioned the AWPU and you, that it's going to be kept at the same level, but surely with inflation that would mean a real-time real cut? Well, what I meant to that, that just, just to specify, yeah, that, I agree. The, the, the action that we took at the start of this year was to allocate seven million to schools. That was to avoid um, a change in the split between the primary and post-primary AWPU because if there had been a reduction in one or other, it would have had a significant impact on some schools, and we were trying to avoid that impact at an individual school level. It doesn't take account of inflation, I acknowledge that. It's really just to keep the balance Ooh. across the two sectors. It's frozen, but in actual real terms, it's a cut. If, if, the, if the additional money hadn't gone in, it would have ended up yeah. being a cut okay. for some schools, yeah. Okay. And that's and that's why we've included nine million as part of our bidding strategy as well, just okay. to cover that. Thank you. And will all uh, capital money be spent for nineteen twenty by the department? Uh, the, that's the aim. It's okay. always it's always a difficult balancing act. That's a hope capital. to names in yeah. here, Gary. Okay. Quite sure um, we're <laughs> William, do you want back in on the budget matter for having yeah. a brief uh, on the program for government? Yeah. If you if you're struggling to spend your capital budget, let me tell you about. A lot of it's okay. just timing, as you'll yeah. understand, with some big schemes. Yeah. You're getting the hard hat on. <laughs> they, 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 are beyond, they are beyond their time. Um, in terms of our, um, the, the, what you talk about in terms of the budget and the, and the accounts for the EAA, yeah. um, one of the things that might help is if area planning was um, accelerated. Um, what can the department do in terms of applying pressure, or has it been doing to apply pressure to EAA? To, to push that along? Uh, I, I can't give a lot of detail on that, other than I, don't, I know that my colleague uh, Janice Scallon is leading that work, and yes, there, there is considerable pressure to see, and I know the Minister is very keen to see things moving as quickly as they can, taking account of all the factors that come into play with area planning, but to really see more progress and taking a lot of these issues forward. Well, there you go be crucial in terms of budget yeah. and accounting. Thanks. But we'll take a detailed briefing on area planning as well, yeah. William. Final, final question. The independent review has requested £1 million over two years, as far as I can see. Does that suggest the department is envisaging the independent review taking two years? Uh, th this was just an assessment of what we feel it might what, what the cost might be associated with an independent review of this nature. So it's in some ways finger in the air in terms of our best estimate. It's really, a, it's assuming a three-person panel and the cost associated, the daily cost associated with that, and a, a kind of an official structure to act as a secretariat. But because it's, it's uh, certainly the wording of the NDNA agreement would indicate it's a very substantial review that might take place, it's hard to tell exactly. We're estimating that resource cost I think on the basis of what we think might be appropriate. I think that's something we need to come back to. I, I suggest quite a few uh, elected representatives and parties might be quite shocked at the suggestion yeah. that that would take two years, given the need and the urgency for reform of doing things differently to help the figures you have in front of you, Gary. I think the reality is we. we I'm not sure whether there's clarity at this stage exactly what that review might look like. So oh, once, once that yep. pans out, I think it'll be easier then to, to okay. estimate. Uh, do you want to make any comments to the programme for government, or will we go straight into questions? You'd like to make a few short comments? Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Thank you. Comments, Chair. Thanks a lot. I mean, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about previous um, FG's outcome. We did receive short briefing previously, um, I believe, and, and got the draft. Um, no. <laughs> You're looking at me quizzically. Um, well, um, I would invite um, Pauline, my colleague, um, um, to take you through the indicator <coughs> and just give an explanation of that. Um, we're focusing on outcome 12. We give our children and young people the best start in life. And then Paul could take questions on the early years programmes and actions that contribute to 
closing the gap in terms of the indicators. I can talk to extended schools and the full service programmes, and Karen, um, my colleague, can cover the curriculum. So for, just... for members, we have information at page 35 of our packs with regards to the high level outcomes and indicators. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, just by way of brief introduction, um, there are 12 outcomes in the programme for government, and there are 42 indicators. So four of those indicators relate specifically to the Department of Education, um, and mainly they, they, they are measuring, I suppose, how the outcome um, is being met in terms of we give uh, our children and young people the best start in life. But they also contribute to outcome three and outcome five, which are about um, you know, a more equal society and also to do with an innovative and creative society. So we do hit quite a lot of the population outcomes. So in terms of um, indicator 11 and 12, which Alison just mentioned, we have a very um, robust source of data to measure those, which is the School Leavers Survey, which is really a census of all pupils um, either leaving school at the end of year 12 or year 14. So we measure their GCSE attainment and their A-level attainment. So the specific indicator that was chosen by the executive um, in terms of school, in, in terms of indicator 11, it's really just a measure of the percentage you're actually leaving school and they have the standard of at least five GCSE A star to C, including equivalents, including GCSE English and Maths, a bit of a mouthful, but um, that's, that's that standard. And then indicator 12, which is more looking at, I suppose, the difference in educational attainment and underachievement, really compares that same measure, but it looks at those pupils who are leaving school who were entitled to preschool meals and those who weren't. So, I mean, do you want me to take you through the figures in relation to those in terms of... Yeah, it'd be helpful just to get a, a brief idea as to performance against those indicators. Okay. So, for these indicators, um, I'm pleased to say that actually things have been getting better. And so, for indicator 11, which is just really the, the, the standard for all pupils leaving school, it's been really steadily increasing the baseline. Um, and the baseline year for all the PFG indicators is 2014-15. So it's now, for 2017-18, for which are the latest figures that we have, um, it stood at 70.6% of all pupils leaving school with that educational standard. And that represents an increase of almost five percentage points from the baseline year. So then, going on to indicator 12, um, where really we're measuring that gap between free school meals entitled and non-free school meals entitled pupils, the gap has been increasing. Um, um, in 2017-18, the gap between those two sets of pupils was almost 30 percentage points, 29.5. Um, but that compares to a baseline figure of 32.4 percentage points. And I suppose what I'd like to point out is that um, there are quite stringent rules about how we decide whether the, the indicator is improving or not, and these are all approved by a technical assessment panel. Um, and in, in terms of the rules around this, there needs to be a reduction in the gap. Also, those pupils who are entitled to free school meals, their attainment has to be improving. And there can't be a reduction in the pupils who don't, who aren't in receipt of free school meals. So, in other words, what we don't want is standard slipping for non free school meal pupils and that closing the gap. It's really you want the, everything to improve for for all pupils, regardless of their their status. How has the performance of non FSME school leavers benchmarked? Has it improved? Yes, it has yeah. improved. Okay. Yes, it has improved over that time period it has been steadily improving. Okay, is there a, uh, an online mechanism or a report that an MLA, a member of the public, can go to to, to see these uh, data in more detail? Yeah, the, at the, the executive office they have what they call a PFG outcomes viewer and every um, 
department, when as soon as they have up-to-date information on any of the indicators, we provide that on the same day that we release it as official statistics. We have to provide that to the executive office as well, and they approve um, the commentary around it, and then that goes straight up onto the outcomes here. So, I mean, I'm happy to share a link to that. Yeah. Does one need a map to find that, or is, no. a, is it? <laughs> I'm hoping it's yeah. straightforward. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be helpful to see that that link. Um, okay. 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 So, any more questions about those two indicators? R Robbie Butler. Yeah. Want to come um, in on those indicators? Yeah. Yes, yes please. Um, so, what are the, do you have a figure for the percentage of pupils in receipt of free school meals who actually sit? GCSE examinations against those who just attain. So, so in making sure that we're comparing apples and apples here, um, that we just don't go for the high high level output. But so the percentage of people who actually do sit the exams and and are turned out, as opposed to those who aren't in receipt of free school meals and, and and don't sit GCSE exams. Um, I, I don't have a figure to hand. Um, I mean there there are some exemptions in terms of pupils who who sit the exam, such as perhaps a, a child is pregnant or you mean other extenuating circumstances like that. But the kind of the rules and the exemptions around that are quite. Stringent, obviously. Um, just to a lot. I mean, this information here, where we're using the school leaver survey, it is all children. I mean, as, as far as I'm aware, the only children who are excluded from that cohort are the uh, young people leaving special schools. And I think from information I got, that's about maybe 300, 400 pupils a year. They're not in here, but the rest is everybody who's... I, I get that, but I think that, that there still could be a disparity when you break down the functionality of the evidence being fed in. I still think, I, I'm assuming, um, and I'm going back to my day, because I, I was the first year to do GCSEs. Don't ask me what I got. <laughs> <laughs> it's not important anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you can become an MLA. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh <dear. laughs> so, but I think, I think it's really important to know what's, get, what's going into the machine here. Okay. Um, so, because the output is okay. Okay, so we can measure the, we can see an improvement there. However, I still would fear that there are, you know, for, for whatever reasons, whether schools are deciding with <coughs> the parents and the people that they're not, it'd be better for them not to do the exams and protect the results because at the end of the day our schools are being measured on our performance and unfortunately we see those tables piled out every year and that's where we're all aiming but I just want to make no, sure I know that exactly. uh, yeah. there is a different data source there that's the summary annual examination results yeah. which is a school level measure and that's the one where there may be um, the wrote like exemptions, the reasons that you can be excluded from the statistics but you can't be excluded from these Statistics, but I appreciate. But you're you're wondering how many children actually sit. Actually, so I, I, yeah, I just, it'll certainly not be 100 uh, percent against for, for for various reasons. But I suspect that the I'd just be interested to know in terms of those on free schools means and those that aren't, if it's the same or if there's a difference. And if there's a difference, then we need to make sure that that's captured in, in the in overall outputs because it will have knock-on effects for employability mm -hmm. and and. and and future sort of higher education. Certainly in terms of the, the data source that Karen's just mentioned, there are around about 7% of pupils who are exempt. I mean, there's a range of different reasons here. Um, they have a serious illness, they've transferred to another school or have emigrated, they're in a special unit approved by the department, they have a statement of special education needs, they've been placed on the notice scheme or they have a serious welfare issue but the, this is it's it's all how many really pupils is seven percent that wasn't an intentional catch -out. i was just it was a genuine the finance guy. He'll know. <laughs> i think it might be around 1500 maybe yeah i think that, that genuinely wasn't like a, a mad question <laughs> <laughs> Could I either ask either for direction to those stats or if, if figures could come back? Yeah. I'd genuinely, yeah. I'd love to get that one sort of bottomed yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, just to McNulty on those indicators, yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Alison. Just maybe I'm missing something here, and uh, I believe in the whole holistic approach to educating children, pupils. There's no mention in terms of the outcomes, actions to mental health and wellbeing in terms of indicators for how we're succeeding in having the whole person as opposed to just academically. 
has to pull in it. Well, I mean, I suppose in terms of the programme for government, um, there are, as I mentioned, 42 high-level indicators that are really measuring um, where the population is at and how things are, are getting better or, or otherwise. And I suppose there, there needs to be a realisation that not everything can be covered within that. Um, but certainly, in terms of the information that we provide, there are also breakdowns as far as we can. In other words, we provide these um, qualification results by gender, um, ethnic group, religion, a, a whole range of different Section 75 groups, urban, rural, and, and, and other breakdowns to try and sort of dig beyond that. But in terms of, I suppose, well-being itself, um, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head if that fits into one of the other outcomes, perhaps from a, a Department of Health related indicator, but certainly it's something that could come out in terms of actions within the outcomes delivery plan, which is really looking at, I suppose, targeted interventions at a much lower level um, that impact on participants on the ground, or in this case, pupils on the ground. So. Surely, surely, surely you would recognise that dividing the, the the uh, emotional and mental well-being of, of children is <coughs> crucially important and it's something that there should be indicators in terms of measurement or outcomes from the, for the programme for government. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a bit, I'm aghast that there is no, no recognition of uh, where we have an epidemic in our society where young people have more to cope with than we ever had in our, in our, in our childhoods and how there is no recognition of the, the, the emotional, mental and well-being of children and developing their resilience to cope with, with the, the, the growing challenges that they face in the, in the modern society, I find that bewildering. Frankly. If I could just come back on that one, um, it's, it's, it's possibly something we need to look at in the development of the new programme for government, which is something we're actively looking at, but I would say the funded interventions that we have that contribute to closing the gap do recognise the importance of mental health and wellbeing in children and there is investment through extended schools and full service schools for example targeting social need that will address specifically mental health and wellbeing in children um, but it's for one of my colleagues in the department to look at that going forward in terms of the development of a new programme. Just to supplement that Justin, my understanding was that one of a previous Program for government commitments was the creation of a what was called a system level dashboard mm -hmm. that I think was to look at different yes. types of outcomes for children and young people. Can you speak to that? Yes, I can, I can pick yeah. up on that one if that's okay. Yeah. And just as a, a bit of background to it as well, um, that kind of dashboard is is a kind of a management inf information tool that's uh, you know would collate a wide range of indicators. Um, that will be used to inform and evaluate policy. You know, it's information that's going to help us improve um, quality and efficiency, leading to better outcomes for um, learners. And you may recall that we participated in the OECD's review of assessment and evaluation. And they reported that in countries that have good um, system level evaluation, they've developed dashboards that are bespoke to their system. Um, and their advi the advice from OECD was that we should do the same. If a dashboard's going to work, you need to set it in the context and values of your own system. So that's what we set out to create when we were taking forward this piece of work. Um, f following OECD's suggestion of a methodology, we started off really with a blank piece of paper and worked with key stakeholders to try and identify what we might include in that kind of dashboard. And um, so we completed two phases of qualitative research. Developed then, it was only at that point we kind of developed some potential indicators that might go in there. And then so I did targeted consultation on that as well. So this initial dashboard that we've got brings together kind of a wide, uh, wide range of proposed indicators, organised <coughs> under four headings, which are around context, quality, progress, and achievement and achievement in its widest sense. So the indicators extend well beyond attainment to include <coughs> indicators, related, indicators related to skills, early childhood development, pupil well-being was one that came up a lot in the discussion, and how we um, committed the level of support that we're giving pupils with educational and additional needs as well. 
There are also indicators proposed in there that would be kind of signals of stress in our system, such as applications for principal post, governor vacancies, staff absence, staff well-being as well was, was raised, and all of which might be seen as kind of early warning signs of um, issues that might impact on quality um, of provision and pupil outcomes in the longer term. Um, in terms of where we've got to in, in that piece of work, most of the indicators being suggested for inclusion can be populated with measures that are already available. I mean, we are a data-rich organisation, so a lot of it, I don't think that would account for about 70% of the indicators that have been suggested. Um, for the remaining indicators, we need to, to develop a work programme to fill those um, <coughs> to identify and fill specific measures, so the things that are coming up today, you know, what should we include and how will we make sure that we're measuring it in the right way. Um, so, and for some of those, I say, some of the work's already underway. I mean, I know there was discussion, I think, with the um, uh, colleagues from Pupil Support who were saying they were starting to look at the wellbeing measures, and we've got the ones around ready to learn in the early years and work that's been progressed that way. Um, but you may have noticed that action was included in the draft programme for government and it was in the outcomes delivery plan for 1819, but it's not specifically referenced in the outcomes delivery plan for, that was published in 2019. And I think that's because developing a dashboard like that is um, it's an enabling activity. It doesn't directly impact on the population. What it does is help us all to make better decisions and inform policy and <coughs> Um, programs and pieces of work on the ground. Um, the advice we received when we were preparing that outcomes delivery plan was that enabling uh, activities shouldn't be included in it. You know, it's things that can directly impact on the population that should be there. But I wouldn't want you to think that nothing's happening on taking it forward. I mean, with, you know, the um, the dashboard, of course, hasn't been finalised or. You know, yet, I mean, given the uh, context we've been working in and developing this, <coughs> but the strands of work to, pro to progress it, um, such as filling information gaps and improving the flow of information around the education system, are being considered as part of a wider data <coughs> strategy. Now, it's not that it stopped <laughs> and being shelved. So is that, that the dashboard is for the education system it's as a, a whole? It's a system level, okay. and I think what it really does, it, it, it's something that if it, if it was there, it would, it's kind of indicators in that would describe our system, but it would also enable us to monitor what's going on yeah. in our system. And what, it is really, it, what is it called? We've just called it a dashboard. Okay. I mean, it's really been... Answers on the postcard? Yeah. <laughs> it would do with a good name. I think it would do with the title. I, I, I think there are... There are benefits uh, from it. Uh, hopefully, the delivery of it is um, sped up rapidly. Um, well, just on that, I mean, as, as I mentioned there, the context we've been working in over the last three years, and we have to be very cognizant as well of the um, ongoing negotiations around the pay and workload offer, because this is a strand of the strand of work in there around uh, school and system evaluation, which we need to. Yeah, of. I mean the the point of the outcomes based accountability approach to PFG and the point of a dashboard is to measure and to report on whether we're achieving what we said we were going to work towards achieving. So I I think it's absolutely vital. It would be interesting to get a more detailed brief in relation yeah. to the dashboard. I would be happy to do course. that. It's like an yeah. online application, so it's not maybe suitable for this. But no, it would be, be happy to useful work. to get a, a visual um, yes. assisted briefing in relation to it. Daniel, do you want to come in on this in particular? No, I'm okay. sorry. Okay, well, that can make a bit, a bit more progress in the presentation and then I can bring you back in because I think Deputy Chair wanted to come in on extended schools as oh, well. Oh, yeah, that's that right. Come in on, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are, okay. Is that okay? Let you make some more progress there? Okay. Um, the other two indicators then, which um, are what's described as being under data development, are indicator 13, um, which is the percentage of schools evaluated and found to be good or better. And this is based on school inspections and the grade, the inspection grade that um, the school is evaluated at. Um, and it's known as OEC1 or OEC2, <laughs> to be more specific. And according to the inspection framework, which changed on January the 2017, 
OEC1 means the organisation has a high level of capacity for sustained improvement in the interest of all learners. And OEC2 is the organisation demonstrates the capacity to identify and bring about improvement in the interests of all learners. So that's how the, the, the indicator is designed to be <coughs> measured. Um, unfortunately, due to action short of strike amongst teachers, um, it's not been possible to collect a sufficient volume of inspection outcomes um, because inspectors haven't been able to carry out the inspections and determine these different <coughs> grades. So that's why inspection outcomes weren't published in the latest Chief Inspector's report for 2016-18. And as a result, it's not possible for us to currently update the <coughs> measure for Indicator 13. But I know that the department is working separately to address issues in relation to action short of strike. So as soon as um, th this information improves, then we will start to measure this indicator again. I'm afraid that's just the situation with regard to that indicator. So that indicator, 13% uh, percentage of schools found to be good or better. Yeah. So what, what is the most up-to-date uh, data in relation to that indicator? Um, From 2016, did you say, sorry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. what what percentage of schools were found to be good or better in 2016? It was in the high 90s. Um, okay. it, 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 they really were performing at a very high standard. And what was happening was it was agreed with the technical assessment panel that any inspection that had happened from uh, 2005 six would be counted within that, so that we had a very good sense of for all schools um, just what what that grading was. Another reason why we can't overstate the importance of delivering fair teacher pay and conditions as well. It, it spans wide, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, then finally, um, in terms of, of indicator 15, um, Paul, if you want to jump in at any stage with regard to this, please feel free. Uh, so this is a measure, um, it's the percentage of children who are at the appropriate stage of development in their intermediate preschool year. Um, and again, we are currently, um, this is currently under data development and it is subject to approval by the technical assessment panel. Um, the proposed data source is the 3 Plus Health Review, um, which some of you may be aware of. Um, and that review was introduced under the Early Intervention Transformation Programme and is now, as I understand it, being mainstreamed uh, across schools. Uh, so it, the idea behind it is it's a developmental review of children in their preschool year carried out by health visitors uh, in the funded preschool sector. So that covers about 92% of all children of that age. Um, so what happens is the, the review uses the, it's described as the ages and stages questionnaire for social and emotional development. And there are three different questionnaires for children aged 36, 48 and 60 months. So the parent working together with the health visitor within the preschool setting completes the questionnaire. And then there's a guided conversation between the parent and the health visitor to, to talk about perhaps some of the responses that have been given. But really the whole idea behind it is that it helps to identify any developmental needs that are required for the child at this very early age so that then they can receive the appropriate support for intervention. And the indicator, whenever we have um, fully robust data, the, the indicator will measure the percentage who are at no or low risk of um, requiring an intervention. So all of this data, it's, it's collected through health visitors, it's uploaded. Um, the public health agency is very much working on this and it's uploaded to the, the Northern Ireland Child and Health System, Child Health System. And presently, Department of Health colleagues are really working with the public health agency in terms of ensuring that this is of a sufficient standard and coverage for us to be able to use it to, to monitor this indicator. That's about it, I think. Okay. Bring members in then. Uh, Karen Moan, Deputy Chairperson. See, so just on that, um, uh, Karen, that last bit about the, the rollout of the Three Plus Review. Um, did it, uh, is how many children have, has that covered? At the moment, 60% um, <coughs> of 60. all children who are in the preschool setting. 
and um, uh, it doesn't include sorry, it doesn't include special education needs pupils because really their needs are assessed under a, a different program. Um, it's great. It maybe something that probably will come back. They just um, just be interested to see in terms of parental engagement and support for parents, but it's all we could do. At a different time, just wanted to come back, Alice, and the uh, the extended schools. And Gary rightly pointed out that the confidence and supply money prevented cuts during the period. Um, they sure start and extend the <coughs> schools. Um, it, it's it's detailed in terms of the forward investment and the partners in education, which is formally extended schools. But will there be um, extra funding and investment in sure start? Do we know at this stage through that? Bottom line. I wouldn't be able to answer that. Um, no. uh, in, in terms of our bidding strategy, we're just bidding to maintain existing services at this stage, so that's something that perhaps would have be a consideration further down the line. It is something we'll probably have to take up with the Minister because um, I know that uh, there was to be a review of Share Start. I'm not sure where that's at, but it does need to be invested and broadened out, so um, something we'll come back to. In terms of the Partners in Education Fund and the new model going forward, will the funding still go through schools? Well, that would be the intention. As I say, we're um, putting a paper up to the Minister for consideration and then we've been invited back to give a detailed briefing on what that might look like going forward. And also, what do you know at this stage? Um, has the Department engaged, engaged with neighbourhood partnerships around this model? We work um, closely with um, neighbourhood regional partnerships anyway. Right. Um, so we do, so to, so to make sure that we're complementing each other, not duplicating provision in areas. So at this stage, they would tell me that they haven't been involved um, locally in my area anyway. So Well, there will be an extensive consultation on the new programme once the Minister has um, right, so that hasn't to look at it, it. so that hasn't happened yet. And then just really, and again, you know, this is this will be part of the consultation, it's how the <coughs> outcomes will be aligned with other departments to deliver on child poverty, anti-poverty and the ch children and young people strategies going we're, forward. We're mindful of that. So that, that really just, and it, 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 it was covered, um, you know, it's it's around the investment that's <coughs> made and where all our departments come in and, um, and that is done jointly. So you're looking at uh, cross-cutting work. So we talked last week about the mental health framework, we mentioned some strategies there, early intervention, addressing links between socioeconomic background and underachievement. So they're all cross-cutting. So rather than if we don't get the money that we, that we bid for, that going directly then to cut these projects, um, are we looking at joint financial packages across all the departments to be able to deliver on these programmes? Well, certainly we have been engaging with other departments, particularly around the development of the strategy um, work, uh, the overarching strategy. But again, that's a paper that I need to give the Minister some time to consider. Um, but we would see um, collaborative working as, as the best way forward in terms of tackling the issues. Because we're going to need that money coming from all our departments because we know education is under enough pressure in terms of school budgets, maintenance, capital, all of that. So to be able to provide the investment needed, we, we need that. So, thank you. Okay, Daniel McCrossan. That's oh, right. Um, my question has largely been answered. It was around how you could measure the effectiveness of the extended schools, given uh, some of the difficulties with the pay dispute and obviously difficulty in inspecting schools uh, over the last few years. But th just a, a, on that point, th this is that... <coughs> Two linked full service programmes operating in North and West Belfast are having notable results. Is there anywhere else? Is it just those two, or is there anywhere else? That you, is there a list of various places that has also had notable results? Well, we have the full service programmes, and we do have um, very good outcomes for both of those programmes. Um, we're also piloting in North Belfast with 21 principals at the moment. Um, a different approach, um, allocating funding to them and giving them autonomy really to spend that on a thematic basis for parental engagement, uh, literacy and numerous impacts for the children. There's some training being um, provided to um, classroom assistants, for example, to help them engage more effectively with parents. So that's we're into the second year of that um, pilot programme um, and we're taking the learning from full service programmes. Um, uh, towards the development of the new extended skills offer as well. So is that specifically North and West Belfast? Is there nowhere else? 
There would be other sources um, of funding for programmes in other areas in Northern Ireland um, through our um, tackling, paramil tackling paramilitarism programme. So we do have wraparound services in East, South, um, West and North Belfast and also um, uh, across in um, Derryland and Derry. Uh, and just a, a very brief point, Chair. Uh, the Department of Education has made a campaign around Miss School, Miss Out. Is that, is that ended or is it still ongoing? No, the campaign is still um, very much active. Um, we promote the importance of parental engagement through those um, campaigns um, and um, we are looking at, we have the Give Your Child a Helping Hand campaign and a refresh of that um, later this year. We're working with the advertising company to do that. So that has been... Um, it's targeted 1.8 million people, 211 TV adverts, um, radio adverts, radio broadcasts, billboards, bus shelters, etc. So we're continuing with that work. Okay. Uh, what, what is the, the name for the North Belfast Pilot Programme? Um, the North so Belfast Pilot, pilot Programme. Program. <laughs> what, pilot program. What's the budget for it? Uh, 250,000. Okay. Um, what's the budget for the North and West Full Service Programme? Mm -hmm. um, 385. Um, thousand for each. For each constituency? Yes, the um, <coughs> Boys and Girls model get 385 and then the Full Service Community Network um, serving the Greater Falls and Upper Springfield gets 385 as well. Okay. I'm tempted to ask what the allocation for East Belfast is, but I know what it is. Um, mm. And everybody else might start asking about their own <laughs> constituencies as well. So I'll leave, that, I'll, well, I'll leave that for another occasion. Um, Robbie Butler? Yep. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Just to uh, roll back again on to Indicator 15. I thought that was a really piece, uh, good uh, uh, piece of information to hear. So it was in around the three plus review, um, the health visitor led uh, model. And I think when we look at the, 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 the global capacity of mental ill health and, and barriers to get, <coughs> it's really important that this piece of work is adequately resourced. So I'm interested to know um, what does the funding model for that look like and what the burden falls on the Department of Education because it's a multidisciplinary team effort through perhaps did you say the PHA maybe were involved in the, the lead in that? Agency, yeah. So um, I, would, I would imagine that the MDT would extend so the health visitors are going to be predominantly made up of probably social workers I would imagine or maybe nurses that type of thing um, and is there a burden a financial burden that uh, comes on, on you guys with that? Uh, I'm just thinking it's one of those I see it as a really really imp important invest to save um, mm. strategies because we're going to have the, 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 the trying to face the problem that we have at the moment with the well-being, resilience and the mental health issues. Yeah. But if we want to get into the preventative mode, it has to happen preschool. That's a really, really important piece of work. When we look at the family structures and the breakdown of, of the, sort of the traditional family structures and so on, and the impact of poverty, for instance, even which will be getting picked up in this. So is there a funding model for that? Which is, uh, could you maybe explain that to me? And um, I'm happy to take that one. There isn't an explicit financial burden on DE in this context because essentially this is an instrument that originated for the purposes of health and, and we're almost piggybacking on that to try and see if we can use it for the purposes of monitoring that particular outcome. Now clearly the financial pressures that health has been experiencing have had a bearing on the rollout of the, of the questionnaire to the extent that, yes, last year we had about 60% of all children having this piece of work done with them in the setting. There is a plan to roll it out to 100%, which is clearly where we want to get to. That's likely to take a couple of years. Um, I think the pressures in the health visitor context has been uh, a factor in that. But there isn't an explicit cost to the department here. It was the, the bigger issue is us needing to get to a point where we're comfortable that it is providing a robust, stable and reliable measure of the sort of educational developmental component of that indicator and that it has the approval of the necessary PFG technical team. But no, there isn't an explicit, we pay this amount each year for this to be done. Justin. Justin McNulty. 
Thank you, Chair. And um, just following on from what Karen was speaking of earlier in terms of Sheriff's Start, I wanted to recognise the presence in the public gallery of, of uh, Conor McArdle, who's a project manager for Sheriff's Start in, in South Armagh with his colleague, and the incredible work they do. I know Conor has got uh, ambitions to extend the services into different parts of South Armagh, and he's working ferociously, diligently, and hard with the department trying to achieve that. So. Uh, I just want to recognise the important work of Sure Start doing within so many communities. Um, in terms of the outcomes and actions, uh, where does the curriculum sports programme, which has been discontinued now, which has been replaced by uh, the sports programme for Key Stage 2, where does it fall under? In terms of which directorate? Or? In terms of the actions and outcomes for the programme for government, where, where does that fall under? Uh, I'd need to come back to you on that. Unless sure. colleagues know. No. I don't know offhand. I need to come the back curriculum to Curriculum Sports Programme. Yeah, so the Curriculum Sports Programme has been discontinued, sadly, in recent years. It's been replaced by a Key Stage 2 programme, and it's about uh, developing children physically. Again, I'm, I'm a big believer in the holistic development of the child, and uh, physical, physical development is huge. And the opportunities the sports offers young people who may not be academically gifted. Um, and develop the whole person. So where does that where does that fall under in terms of the We'd actions that come back to you on that? That, yeah. that would sit with one of my colleagues, um, regrettably, but we will come back with something in writing on that. Thank you. Okay, Robin Newton. Can I just ask you a fairly simple question in terms of the joined upness between the program? We're under fours in the targeted interventions. <coughs> our halfway fund. And the toy box. How do they integrate together? How do they? Like they all seem to be addressing a similar issue, mm. there, um, rather than. I'm a wee bit confused as to. So. Well, perhaps I can take that. They're all part of a suite of interventions, as you say, in that not to four period aimed at progressing us towards the objective of having all children at the appropriate stage of development when they go into primary school. So all of the, the three that you mentioned, I think Sure Start, Toy Box and Pathway, are all targeted, so they're not universal. So they're targeted, if you like, at addressing the issues faced by children from various backgrounds. Sure Start is targeted geographically based on the 25% um, most disadvantaged wards, although there are issues around um, the actual targeting there and, the, and the, the, the data that's still being used for that, and I'll be elaborating a bit on that again next Wednesday. But, um, Can we someday now? Yes, good. <laughs> yes, I, I, I think I've trailed it too, too much here. Um, the the uh, pathway fund then comes in, if you like, as a referral point for those that need even more specific support, um, Sure Start, for example, would be referring children to Pathway, where it's available to give even more intensive one-to-one -one engagement where that's needed. Um, and then we have um, the Toy Box Fund, which is specifically focused at traveller ch children from traveller backgrounds. So, so the, the, the toy box is a pretty exclusive one. You, very narrow. You know, very yes. narrow f yes. features. Uh, would there be sort of interchange between the other two then, the Sure Start and Pathway, that a child might exchange from one to... Yes, and might indeed avail of both. Depend. Might avail of both. Yes, yeah. and Sure Start is by far the largest, um, um, and... Pathways, a relatively small fund from memory, around three million a year, um, as opposed to I think around 26 on Sure Start. But I'd, I'll check those figures for you. But there is um, very much um, a, a good relationship between the two funds on the ground, each referring and making clients aware of the other. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Rob. Can I ask a brief follow-up question to that, given the early intervention theme? Um, government had previously funded uh, the Book Start programme uh, up to 2015, which is uh, a universal first year reading inter intervention to develop a, a love of books, um, parental engagement in reading, absolutely vital on the child development and, and learning process. 
Um, I think Northern Ireland is the only region of the UK to not have such an intervention, and we're going to hear from the Book Trust later on, so I'll, I'll not preempt that too far. But my understanding is that that Book Trust is seeking in the region of fifty thousand pounds per year only um, to be able to deliver that universal reading intervention. Is that an allocation that has been considered in these bids? Is it an allocation that could be considered in these bids? Need to check. Okay. Um, you Don't want to consider it on the record. Um, we're going to we're going to be hearing from it more detail, members. But at, when you consider the sums of money in terms of the millions that are spent on some of the other interventions, I think there's significant research to say that small additional amount to target on the literacy and the reading and the parental engagement that comes from that is something that I would certainly like to hear more on and, and be eager to hear your consideration and response to. Yeah, go ahead. Chair, was just to say that there is, um, as part of the Getting Ready to Learn programme, uh, an element that focuses on encouraging reading. The Big Bedtime Read, as it's um, labelled, has uh, worked in a range of preschool settings in uh, inviting in parents to read with their children, providing books to take home. So um, there is a component of, of the offer that has some emphasis on that, but that's not to say it replaces what might have been available through the, the other alternatives. I guess the key aspect of the bootstart is it's a pack that you know is delivered to every every uh, newborn child in, in Northern Ireland. I think there's a significance to that. And as I say, unless I stand corrected, we are the only region of the UK that doesn't do that. So uh, I'd be keen to explore that further. A few other members to come in. Uh, Morris Bradley. Thank you very much, Chair. I look forward to your presentation. I'm sure starting with a, a big impact in my area. So mm -hmm. not asking any questions until, that, until next week. But you, you, you mentioned there yourself, uh, Dyckman Paramilitarism uh, in North Belfast, and you alluded to having some schemes in the North West. What schemes have you in the North West, and where are they, and how much is your budget? I actually, um, apologies, I came to talk about the actions that contribute to the programme for government, which oh, sorry. those aren't part of. That's all right, not a problem. The other thing, uh, <laughs> mental health and wellbeing, is there collaboration between yourselves and the Department of Health? There would, yeah, but would yeah, be. there would definitely be. I don't have detail, but there definitely would be ongoing. Okay, okay. 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 Uh, Catherine Kelly to finish this on our questions. Um, I think that the fact that your start has been mentioned here many times um, just proves the importance of it um, and the amazing work that that goes on. Um, my question is probably something that you want to come back to um, next week, Paul, but I thought I would get it in here now, give you time to come back Thank to you. me. Um, it's just on the health professionals within Sure Start. Um, the pressures that are on our health service are actually pulling speech and language therapists, midwives away from Sure Start. How is the department um, coping with that, and how is that affecting the outcomes of the children? It's certainly something I'd be keen to address next week. I have been out and visited a number of Sure Starts, and those are the sorts of messages that I'm hearing. Um, in a sense, Sure Start is an example of collaboration between the and the Department of Health. Um, and indeed, even around the resourcing of it and the implications okay. of the squeeze on our budget and the health budget and all of that, those are factors that we're actually looking at. So I'm, I'm aware of that issue and I'm happy to cover it next week. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the briefing for next week is entitled Early Years in Childcare. Just to save you, Paul, in terms of how wide we're stretching that. Um, yes. that, is, that is the intended theme of the briefing. Yes. Um, but look, thanks very much indeed, um, officials, for your, your briefing and your, your answers today. I think it's extremely helpful to get into the programme for government indicators and, and measurements. Um, for me, it's the most important um, aspect of the government, um, whether it is achieving what it said it was going to achieve. I appreciate it's been an extremely challenging time for officials to progress these matters in the absence of a government and a minister. Um, and I'd be 
keen to return to some of those more detailed presentations with you know visual aids of, of the various dashboards and measurement tools that you have available to assist you with those matters. So um, do you know when the new program for government might be agreed or completed? Um, there was certainly there was communication came out yesterday from the executive office, and they're looking, I think, for a, a new uh, a sort of new draft outcomes delivery plan okay. by the end of April. And that'll be one year for twenty twenty one at this stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, look, all the best with that important work, and I'm, I'm sure we'll engage with you, especially you, Paul, next week. It seems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, can I ask the clerk to summarise uh, the actions and requests for additional information resulting from our briefing? Yes, Chair Person. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Which has happened before. So, so members, if I've understood correctly, uh, what members have, uh, have asked for, uh, writing back to the department, uh, seeking quite a bit of information about our redundancy. So, we're looking for figures initially around non teaching. Uh, in previous years and what their plans are, including around classroom assistance. Yep. We're also asking them for the position on the Investing in the Teaching Workforce Scheme and uh, asking also for them, I think we're also seeking a briefing actually, on their redundancy plans and the extent to which it's value for money. Yep. Maybe that's something for after Easter members because yep. yep. that might be timely. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, now, the committee has previously asked for a breakdown on the 10 million for the emotional health and well-being framework, so that, that's already in, in the post, okay. as it were. Uh, so then additionally, I think uh, members are seeking an oral brief on the extended schools uh, programme. Um, that's probably from the EA and the department, I would guess. Mm -hmm. um, is, does the committee wish to write to the department just seeking clarification around Rate relief for fee-paying schools with charitable status. Yep. Any, any examples? Yep. Any examples? Because I haven't heard of that before. Um, additionally, then uh, members are seeking, I think, um, an explanation from the department about how maintenance, capital maintenance priorities are determined, um, and also uh, seeking information on schools in deficit uh, of over uh, one million pounds. And presumably, also members will be looking for the the in-year deficit as well. So the deficits that are quoted. Or that's a rolling deficit, uh, so they added up um, over a couple of years. It might also be interesting to know what the the in year problems may be, because that would be a different and probably more revealing figure. Um, now, members, have I missed anything in terms of the budget stuff there? Yeah. William and Robin. Yeah, William. Well, maybe it's within, Robin, yeah, go ahead. Maybe it's within chair, but uh, the ten million for the tackling the underachievement. Uh, I presume that a bed wasn't made without. Gary having some sort of supporting framework there, and whether or not they'd be prepared to share that support framework or whatever they might call it. Sure. Yeah. Chairperson, would do that just just to come back on that member's good point. I think in the table papers, and this is what we'll tease out in the department. They seem to be indicating this is going to go into the Partners in Education program, which is the new name for extended schools. Right. But I think well, the member wants no member wants to tease that out. Well, there, there, I mean, there must be some sort. Of, yeah. 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 Okay, William? Yeah, just on that point, um, he did say that there was collaborative joined upness. If they could expand on that, he didn't uh, expand yeah. on that during the presentation. The other thing is, uh, if members are in agreement, uh, there was confirmation when Mr. Bradley raised the issue of the nurture units, not the 31, uh, but across hundreds. I think we just need to write to the department um, because they have confirmed that is the case. And I know they said they were going to come next week and talk about it, but they're going to come next week and confirm that it's 2.5 million over hundreds of schools. I think we need to write to them and say that just isn't enough. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. <coughs> Members, and then in terms of the programme for government questions, um, I think the uh, committee is looking for a link to the outcomes um, uh, paper. I, I can send you that, but we'll ask the department anyway. Um, also, uh, I think Mr. Butler was asking around the percentage of uh, children on free school meals, not on free school meals, who are not included uh, in the GCSE statistics. Yeah. That information, I'll, I'll send it to the member anyway, but we'll write to the department because that, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, additionally, I think the committee is seeking a briefing and uh, some visuals on the new dashboard. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also looking around extended schools for the consultation timescale. 
and also uh, more information about the North Belfast pilot, um, which is around sort of thematic uh, autonomy for principals. Mm -hmm. Additionally then, um, members, we're just looking for more information on the sports programme. There's actually some correspondence about this, but it doesn't answer the members' question about where it sits in terms of the programme for government and even where it sits within which directorate it's in now, which is, uh, I don't know the answer to. Um, also then, I think for next week, we're looking for more information about Sure Start and the Early Years Pathway. And, um, and I think, is the committee then writing to the department indicating its support for a bid for um, Book Start, the 50,000 or so? Is that, if I understood that correctly, Chairperson? I, I'm content to propose that. Maybe we could uh, give members an opportunity to hear yeah, from our presentation before thinking. we confirm that as well. So Sorry, members can tell that. In terms of the sports program, it's more than just the sports program. Where does physical education development fit within the good program for them? Program for them. Yeah, good. Old. And the online link to the program for government yes. measurements. Yeah. Yep. No problem. Okay. I'll get those. Members I'll get those content to agree to those actions. Any yeah. others? Yeah, I First. agree. Just. Uh, Alison Chambers raised the North Belfast pilot, and I asked her about what North they West. Have, uh, uh, if she could, even though it's only an email, let yeah. me know what she has in plans for the North, North West, West area. For where, sorry? For North West. West. When we take Corey and London area. Right, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yes. It, even if it's uh, just an, an, an information yep. email. It's okay. already email. Well, no, we'll add it to you, and it's a legitimate question. Um, is it all just in Belfast or in the city of Derry, county of London, Derry? Yeah, no, so it was a specific reference was made to pilot yeah. programmes in the North West yeah, yeah. as well, yeah, so some detail on that. Okay. Please. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, just some of the answers to various questions that were posed today that were very light in detail. You know, good luck to them next Wednesday because they can't say we'll see you the following Wednesday because they're going to have to have some answers to some of the questions. I don't feel that some of the questions were answered adequately today at all, <coughs> uh, which is disappointing given the extensive panel that they brought. Yeah, I, th I think we're having to work for information from quite a few well, of the yeah. witnesses over the last few weeks, so we'll, we'll the brush passed quite continue a to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, members content to agree those actions and requests for information. Um, and also, okay. And can I also determine uh, members' views on the department budget submission? Are, are members uh, content for me to articulate a view on behalf of the committee at the supply resolution d debate, indicating support for the departmental budget bids, but taking um, note of some of the concerns in relation to some of the gaps, um, and also, uh, I read a, a support for expedited reform in particular to area planning as well to go along with that increased investment members content with that type of approach from me yeah 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 okay um that's great okay then we can move on to our next agenda item which is an oral briefing from book trust ni uh can i welcome uh, miss liz canning head of book trust ni Mr. Connell McCardle, Project Manager, South Armagh Sheer Start. Dr. Kate Mayers, Parent and Academic from Queen's and Newcastle University. And Shona Johnson, Family Nurse Partnership Manager at Southeastern Trust. Uh, can I refer members to briefing paper at page 40 of your packs uh, from the clerk? Uh, briefing paper from Book Trust NI at page 42. And correspondence from Book Trust NI at page 46. I'll indulge you as well to say page 47 has uh, what I consider to be the extremely helpful information in relation to the briefing as well. You might want to pay particular attention to that. And can I invite our witnesses to make a short presentation of no more than 10 minutes to the committee? You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning. Or morning. As um, the Chair said, I, I'm Liz Canning, Head of Book Trust in Northern Ireland. I welcome the opportunity to speak to the committee today and to present the Book Trust's case to have the Northern Ireland uh, Book <coughs> stated. I'm delighted that colleagues from partner organisations who are with us here today, um, Shona Johnston, Family Nurse Partnership Manager, Connor Model from Joe Starts Half Armour, and uh, Dr. Kate Mayers, who's here as a parent and an academic. 
Um, I hope the briefing papers clearly set out our case. Um, I'll try and, and stick to the key points <coughs> because um, I think the most interesting and possibly pertinent um, part of today's presentation will be the colleagues that are going to speak in support of, um, of the Book Start programme on the ground. Um, I have a few bits and pieces which I can leave at the end um, if, if any of you are interested rather than pass around additional things now. So, who are Book Trust? Um, we have a, an About Us brochure which I'm very happy to, um, to supply later that gives all the details of us. But we're, uh, we're the largest reading charity in the UK and we're dedicated to getting children reading. It's very simple, we just want more children to read and more children to read for pleasure. And we know that's important because children who read are happier, they're more empathetic and they're more creative. They also do better at school. Um, reading is great for babies' brain development and a wonderful way for families to bond and spend time together. And Connor and Shona will um, be giving some great examples of that. And reading is pivotal. Uh, reading with children is pivotal to developing early language skills, and it here will um, attest to that. So here in um, Northern Ireland, Book Trust has been supporting children and families to get reading from birth right through beyond secondary school for over 20 years. And this includes programmes that we have, such as the Letterbox Club for looked after children, which many of you will be aware of, um, the Time to Read programme for primary one children, and then we organise author events to inspire excitement around books and reading and um, campaigns such as Bath Book Bed to encourage bedtime reading. So we do a whole raft of things, uh, but we do see Bookstart as the foundation to everything else that we do because that's the very, very first, um, first programme with babies. As the committee know, uh, funding for the Northern Ireland Bookstart programme was cut in 2015 meaning that Northern Ireland now is the only region of the UK that doesn't have um, this kind of early reading intervention. In 2014-15, which was the last year that we had the Book Start programme, um, it consisted of a baby pack and a preschool pack called Treasure. And we gifted over 100,000 books to 50,000 50, families that year. And we also provided support to children with additional needs and whose first language wasn't English. We were able to do that um, through dual language books, again, um, without going into too much detail, if um, a health visitor was working with um, a family whose first language was Polish, then we were able to supply a dual language Polish-English book, as it's so important for families to read in, in their own language. Um, since 2015, we've sought funding wherever we can to continue to get as many children as possible reading. But our priority has always been to provide Bookstart baby packs, as I said, because that's the foundation. Over the last year, we've managed to gift 4,000 baby packs in Northern Ireland through a mix of statutory underspend, grants, some corporate sponsorship, and um, sure starts of ordered some through their own budgets. But given the benefits of reaching families at this early stage, our concern is that this represents only 16% of the population. Um, and worryingly, it's really patchy geographically, whereas we've been able to get to um, quite a number of families in Belfast through corporate sponsorship. In Derry, for example, um, there has been hardly any packs other than the ones gifted through the Family Nurse Partnership. And I think that was 40 in a year. You know, it's, um, that, that, um, that really concerns us as well. Children and families are at the heart of our work and we're com committed to the continuous development of book trust activities to ensure that they meet the diverse and changing needs of families. And as we know, there have been huge changes for families over the last number of years, um, with increased poverty, shift working, newly arrived families, not to mention 
um, the number of screens and devices that are in homes all competing with books and outdoor play. So it really is um, a changing landscape for, for us and our programme. And we've, we did a huge piece of segmentation research whereby we uh, worked with a lot of families to learn more about how family life has changed and that informed our new strategy and underpinning theory of change. Um, and although Book Start Baby is a universal offer, we've actually designed our new programme, which I'll just talk about in a moment, with priority groups in mind. So we, are, we do want to be universal, but we're very aware that there are um, a core group of parents who are less engaged with reading, possibly less affluent, and we need to be able to talk to them and connect with them in a particular way. So we've done an awful lot of work with that and work closely with professionals um, on the ground. So again, the importance of, of having um, Shona and Connor here today from Sure Start and Family Nurse Partnerships. Um, I have a copy of our uh, Theory of Change, which again, I, I can hand out to you. Um, the aim is getting children reading, and it clearly sets out the outcomes that we see for, for families and children. And when the committee has, has a chance to look at that, and I do apologise for not getting it to you before, it actually is barely signed off, but I have been given permission to share it with you. Um, I hope you agree that as an outcomes-based organisation, we could make a contribution to the Northern Ireland programme for government, um, the outcome giving our children and young people the best start in life, and specifically Indicator 15, Improving Child Development. So we are an organisation that's evolving and this year we've launched a new and refreshed Bookstart Baby programme. It's still the same in many ways, but uh, we've put an awful lot of work into how we communicate our messages with parents. Um, this is the back here. And again, um, lovely and colourful, uh, looks like a lovely bright bag of books that actually defies all of the work that's gone into it by our research and programmes teams. An awful lot of uh, work has gone into it. You know, here on the bag, we're recognising that parents are so many things, you know, whether you are a tummy tickler or a storyteller or, you, you know, whatever you are, you're lots of different things to your child. And then inside, it would be um, the same as previously with two good quality board books, especially chosen by our uh, reading panel, which uh, we convene each year, a panel of experts to choose the books. And um, we would always say the pack is for the whole family, not just the child, because the parental guidance, again, newly designed to set out the child's reading journey. Um, not beyond the capabilities we hope of most parents, just to have a quick look at that and see what is happening with their child's development at not to three or three to six months. Signposting what they could do in terms of storytelling, rhymes, talking with your baby. Um, we have packs of those. Um, and that's where I might start running out of time, so I'm not going to talk about those <laughs> anymore. Uh, so new and refreshed baby pack, uh, new and refreshed Northern Ireland Assembly and Education Committee. Is this an opportunity um, to talk more? I hope so. Um, but what this pack would do is put books directly into the homes of 24,000 uh, families. And we know the importance of having books in the home for access, home ownership, Book ownership is key to children developing reading habits from an early age. Um, the programme is also cross-departmental. It contributes to outcomes on health, education and indeed the arts as well. And it's delivered in partnership with Health Visitors Sure Start. It's, it is truly cross-departmental. And it provides excellent value for money through national scale. As an organisation, um, we're working at scale. We have generous supported publishing partners um, and local delivery through health trusts and, um, and obviously the Book Trust NI staff. So 
the committee knows our ask. Um, it's clearly set out. We're suggesting that if, if the Northern Ireland Government could <coughs> contribute £50,000 towards PAC costs, um, Book Trust would um, make up the shortfall from our own uh, fundraising efforts. And then with regard to monitoring and evaluation, uh, we use a mixed method approach to understand and measure the impact of our activities. And that includes a large-scale UK um, household survey and uh, beneficiary surveys and community-level engagement with children and families. And what we would like to do is to scale up that community engagement um, to include Northern Ireland and then to present our 2020 evaluation findings to the committee in the following year. Um, so that, that's our proposal. But more importantly now is probably hearing what really is happening on the ground in Northern Ireland. And I wonder, could I ask Connor first, please, if you would? Thanks very much, Liz. Can we get a phone call from Liz asking you to do a favour? Mm. And you only have to turn up and, 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 and we have... Uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and no way, I'm absolutely delighted to be here to endorse uh, Bookstart. Uh, they are great books. I'm in the middle of one of them. I have to get a finished by the weekend. But <laughs> the, uh, it, it's, uh, we, over the period of time I've been managing Sure Start, we have purchased around about 2,000 packs and handed them out. And I could tell you a thousand stories of how it affects families. But one of the areas that I was thinking of this morning coming up the road was we were working, we have about 1,600 mothers restaurants. Uh, and in 2013, we had about 64, no, less than 64 fathers. So something had to be done. So we used Bookstart as that means to say to men, come in, this is something practical, it's tangible. And it also brings that bonding between father and child, which we know has changed over the decade, but it, 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 it ignores that, you know, getting down on the floor with your, your infant with this uh, and telling them how important books is when they start. Now, we use this as a key method to doing it. At the minute, we've around 700 fathers, members, and, and about 55% of them are fully engaged in our services. And I think it is a part of that book start model we, get, we use the book starts to go into uh, libraries and work with libraries for story time with uh, BME community uh, and others. We also recently, needed, about two weeks ago, I ran an antenatal uh, uh, programme for uh, couples um, and to the Chinese. <coughs> and uh, there was about 40, 42 couples come in and I had fathers in one corner talking about these books. And it was just interesting where... These are new to our services, and they thought, oh, books, and one of the guys says, I never thought about books, you know, I never thought about books at all, toys and you know, smiths and big plastic uh, stuff and all the rest of it. So that has been a, a, a tremendous uh, asset. As sure start, we do purchase, as I say, outside our budget, or within our budget, and, and, I, and every time I'm looking at my budget, it is a priority with us, you know, and as times are getting very hard for sure starts. We've been flat lying now for possibly now six years. We've got a, a cut of 3.4% about seven years ago. We haven't recovered from that. Uh, uh, and uh, I'd love to be here next Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll see you in the night. But no, really, I, I'm not going to take 10 minutes because I, I could, as I say, talk about a 1,000 families, talk okay. about the families we work with in knowing to social services. But before I stop, I'd like to thank Justin for your, your uh, comments earlier on. Uh, I much appreciate it, and I'll pass it on to the team. Thank you. So there's a particular, you know, Connor focused in on, on dads there, um, and then Shona working with teenage mums, perhaps okay. you could say a little bit. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, my name is Shona Johnston, and I manage the Family Nurse Partnership t Team in the South Eastern Trust. My background is... Um, well, I'm just old. I was a midwife, a health visitor, skilled nurse, really everything you could think of. But I'm now in the Family Nurse Partnership team. So I suppose the reason for telling you that is what I'm about to say really applies to the whole public health nursing team, and particularly health visiting. So to tell you a wee bit about Family Nurse Partnership, it's an early intervention preventative programme for first-time teenage mums, and it involves intensive home visiting from early in pregnancy until the child's two. Um, the aims of it really are to improve pregnancy outcomes and child health and development, especially in those hard to reach groups. And teenagers are 
renowned for not engaging with services, so we encourage that um, as well. It's steeped in those theories of attachment and um, self-efficacy and human ecology. But many of our young mums are care-experienced children, looked after children, children previously on the Child Protection Register or currently on the Child Protection Register, children who have experienced trauma and um, have a lot of adverse childhood experiences. Many there, therefore have never been read to or nor do they read. So part of our work is, you know, for us early intervention is key to um, be able to transform lives and also break those cycles of intergenerational disadvantage, abuse and trauma. Um, and reading um, book start packs and introducing books early in pregnancy helps us do that. Um, we encourage our clients really from early in pregnancy and right through to talk to, to read to, to sing to, to their bumps. Um, and because we know the benefits in relation to establishing a really positive, secure attachment early in pregnancy, which then transfers when the baby's born, and also in the development of um, baby brain development, which we know the evidence is there, um, you know, about how the earlier you intervene, i.e. talking to your bump and talking to the baby while it's still in utero, it really makes a difference. Reading also helps reduce stress in both mums and babies, and particularly in our client group. They do get very very stressed, they get quite anxious, so again, having a book to read um, to their baby, whether they still be pregnant or when the baby's born, helps with that as well. It also helps their, their babies um, hear different expressions um, and emotions and sounds. Um, and then later on it develops their social and emotional language um, and encourages babies then later to point, to look, to listen, to touch and to answer questions about, about whatever book they're reading. So in this digital social media dominated world where teenagers don't usually pick up a book, um, Bookstart helps us to bring our young clients back to basics. Um, what it does is it, it, it encourages them to read, to sing, to um, do their nursery rhymes, which a lot of them don't know. Um, and it, it has that, it encourages that interaction between um, their babies um, and themselves to help develop secure, positive attachments later on in life. So the book start packs as practitioners help us to offer something for them to keep, um, something that's theirs, a gift that can have an enormous positive impact um, on child health and development. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. This is why we work with <coughs> professionals like this. We are experts around books and choosing books and, and why reading is beneficial to children, but these are the guys on the ground that uh, really uh, make the difference. Um, and then Kate as a parent and a linguist. Yes. Um, um, hi, thank you so much for, for having us to come and talk to you about this. I am so passionate about this, I can't begin to tell you. Um, for me, literacy is not a luxury and it should not be a lottery. Um, I'm a parent whose children benefited massively from this scheme when they were babies. I benefited too, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But I'm also an academic researcher now and my focus is on children's literacy development at a young stage. I don't believe that we should consider early literacy to be a luxury in Northern Ireland. We know from statistics given by SIA that one in five of our 11-year-olds transitions from primary school to post-primary school, not achieving the literacy standards that they should achieve. So that's like six kids in every single primary school class aren't managing to meet those standards. There's extensive evidence that I have brought with me that I can leave with you that indicates that children's literacy starts in the home before they even get to school. Um, and all those points that Shona was raising about, you know, children's language development needs to start in the home and books are a perfect way for that to occur. Um, my own study has shown that literacy-based activities in the home have a massively positive impact on children once they start school. Um, and it's not just in P1 and P2, it is right the way through. We've heard from your colleagues from the Department of Education saying they want good outcomes for all children, regardless of st um, status in Northern Ireland, which is one of the reasons why I think this programme really deserves some support. Um, I was so impassioned in 2015, whenever the funding was cut, that I actually went and started a petition online through change.org, which is how I came in into contact with Liz. And through that, we had over 700 people from around Northern Ireland just saying, can't believe the funding's gone. And I've actually brought some of the comments, which again, I can leave with you. People saying that, you know, we're health professionals, educational professionals, and we know that some children do not have books in their homes. They don't, and there's evidence that says that if children have books in their homes, they are more likely to be read with by their parents. 
So it, it makes sense as a model to have this early intervention. Um, some parents may not understand the importance of modelling positive literacy behaviours in the home. I didn't when my eldest was born 13 years ago. I knew it was good to read with my baby, but I didn't really understand. And the pack that Liz has shown today explains really simply for parents why there's a benefit. Um, so the books given by Book Trust and the Book Start programme, they're not just books, they're opportunities for parents to engage with their children, creating these firm foundations for lifelong learning, which is what we want in Northern Ireland. Um, children really do need this early years intervention. So it's not a luxury, and I don't think it should be a lottery. With a lottery, there are always winners and losers, and I don't think anybody in this room would be content in signing off and saying we want there to be children who lose out in Northern Ireland. It could be argued that we should go to libraries, and we know that Northern Ireland Libraries does amazing work, but not everybody feels comfortable in those spaces. Not everybody is fully aware of, of what's available. And like Connor said, you know, through, through their partnership with Book Trust, they've been able to signpost and direct people to libraries. So it's almost like this system that just creates and grows. Um, and we have to accept that some people have never been to a library and don't have great literacy themselves, so they're not comfortable talking about it. And that's something that we can't deny. You could argue that a targeted approach would work, um, but in drawing up criteria, there will be children who will fall through the cracks. There will be people and families who will fall through the cracks. Um, and they will be the loser in this literacy lottery and that will have long-term detrimental impacts. So for my part, um, I don't hide the fact that after both of my children, I was diagnosed with postnatal depression. And on, at my worst, I couldn't leave the house. So going to a library was just, you know, I couldn't make it to the car. I want me to go into a library and pick a book. I couldn't do it. So when we had a health visitor come out and in the fog of, you know, no sleep and nappies and babies, I had somebody saying to me, just sit, chill out, read this book with your baby. And actually it was a way, I didn't have to make that decision myself. And I am incredibly decisive and able to make decisions, but there was a point where I couldn't and I wasn't able to. So in a sense, it provided me, it took away any uh, burden on me. It was this gift that just gave to both me and my children. Um, book start, it can't fix these problems that we're all alluding to, but it can definitely address them and it can definitely go some way to providing for all children. So this issue of early, you know, universal home-based literacy provision, I think there's no question that every child in Northern Ireland should have access to this scheme. So again, literacy is not a luxury and it should not be a lottery. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kate. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great case for universal <laughs> yeah. early intervention there. Thank you so much for your, your, your presentations today. Um, I think I proposed that you write to the committee to seek an opportunity to brief this. So thank you for not letting me down in any way whatsoever. <laughs> that is you, one of the most comprehensive presentations I've ever uh, seen at any assembly committee. Um, I, I haven't had any more valuable experience in life than time spent reading with my children. And you've substantiated all the multiple outcomes that are achieved by so doing. Um, given the research and the evidence that shows the importance of investment in early years and the explicit commitments of the Northern Ireland Executive in early years, I, I think this is a must. But I will open the floor to members to ask questions and start with uh, Daniel McCrossan. Well, thank you to Ichi for your uh, very good presentations. And I agree with the Chair fully, certainly since the Assembly should have this is one of the best presentations that I have witnessed. Uh, and something that's quite interesting to listen to. Um, there, there's big changes within the, the home and, and or society generally in terms of um, how information is shared and how uh, we treat information and also how we engage with one another. And obviously, uh, devices in the home uh, is a, having a big impact there in terms of uh, books and everything. Like, for instance, I, I've got a Kindle. I can't use it because I'd rather read of a file or something physical, but that's just the way I've been brought up. <laughs> Even at 31 years of age, it's still rather something physical in my hand as opposed to um, uh, uh, the, the device. And I've just looked, my, my brothers and sisters have, uh, there's five children between them and they're, they're all under the age of five. And 
my older sister's quite strict with her two children in relation to TV time and getting near devices and everything else. But my other sister, <laughs> her child could operate an iPad better than I could uh, at a, quite a young age, which is not what I agree with, but it shows you the huge change that has existed there. So my question really is, what impact do you feel these devices introduced into the home, do, do you feel they have a detrimental impact on the development of the child or, or a positive addition? Or... Um, as well as a book or not? Uh, as a regional organisation, we would say there's, there's obviously room for both. We live in a digital age and we can't deny that. And um, I mean, the internet has, has opened up a whole world of, of you know, learning and opportunity. Um, but books do that too, you know, we would say book. And there is room for both. I mean, certainly at a, a young age, um, our preference would be that children would um, use books and, and have limited screen time. Um, but uh, obviously that's individual per parental decisions. Um, for me, that's nicer than a screen. If it's thrown out of the pram, it's not going to smash. You know, it can be <laughs> more <laughs> You know, so it's so much more practical. Um, shove it in your handbag, you know, put it in the buggy, take it everywhere with you. Um, and you know, with the aid of, of a, a willing adult reading those words and making those sounds, the children are just going to get so much more out of it. But certainly further on up the line, uh, there's definitely room for both. And um, if children are reading on screens, they are still reading, but they uh, need that positive early experience. You know, um, you can't cuddle up with, with a a device as well, you know, mm. it's all about that quiet moment. Folks, just briefly, we're limited for time and sure. I have a few members that have indicated, so if we could keep our questions really concise, I'll, I'll allow everybody to get in and ask the, the brief question that they want to. Do you have a very brief supplementary yeah. done? Ju just in, in terms of, of, of the home these days, I, I get the sense that there's more, not in every home now, there's some issues, there's some uh, uh, homes where there, there isn't, but there's more opportunity for educating a child now than there ever was, certainly from when I was younger, and more so from other members who are older than, much older than I am. Uh, but, but you keep emphasizing school. Yes, I know. Eventually. It's, it's, it's <laughs> instantaneous. Even TV programs have all tuned in to educating the young, that, that child who is watching the TV, and, and the same with these devices and everything else. But uh, I, I, I'll, I'll just say that my parents did read to me when I was quite, when I was a child, and the two of the books I noticed are still going about. One is Green Eggs and Ham, and the other was The Hungry Caterpillar. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had the pleasure of reading both <laughs> to uh, my nephew and niece uh, in recent times. But what I have found is what my niece is two years of age. She could have a conversation nearly with me because of the interaction at early age between the mother and father and that child. And I do see the huge benefits of that. It's very strong engagement away from TVs, away from devices, just simply sitting down and engaging with that child. So I think the work you're doing is tremendous. You certainly have my support. Uh, and I thank you for your contribution as well. Good man. OK. Rob Newton. I'm sure there was a question in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is there one for everyone else? Yes. <laughs> uh, Chair, Chair, I will try to be brief. I don't understand. I don't understand the the, 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 the the why the cuts were made in in the early stages and so maybe if you could let us know how long were you receiving support? Um, tell us a bit about the joined upness between and you were here when we referred to the pathway fund and the sure start fund at, at an earlier stage and when it was cut was it 50k that the of support that you were getting uh, from education? No, it was significantly more. Significantly more. But you're asking for 50k at this stage, mm -hmm. and that's only <coughs> the supply of materials. Am I right in that? Yes. It's only for the supply of materials. So you're asking 50k towards the pack costs and the delivery, and then you would work <coughs> through Sure Start and the other organisations to for them to actually deliver to the rollout deliver. of the program. Yes, um, it's in the past. It was through the health visiting teams health that visiting we team. we did the delivery because they're the universal service. Um, was, was was it health that cut the budget then? No, uh, the funding came from the Department of Education. Um, it, it was within the Racing School Standards um, team that we had the the funding from. Not within early years. It, 
my feeling is that if it had been within the early from the earliest team, it might have been a different uh, outcome. But um, it came through raising school standards. It was um, it was two hundred and twenty five thousand was the last grant that we had a grant each year, and it was for the bookstop baby pack, the treasure pack for all preschool children, um, and then we also uh, provided we had some campaigns and additional support for special needs, book touch uh, packs for blind children, book shine for um, deaf children and so on. So there were different layers of support built in uh, for that particular funding. Okay. What we have done, um, being mindful of, of the funding situation and, and the pressures and uh, just being determined, I suppose, to try and get Bookstart back into Northern Ireland. We've paired everything back to the point where we know we can offer um, a Bookstart Baby programme across the board. Uh, the actual real but cost not, but will not be universal. about... Yeah. It will be yeah. universal, yeah. 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 The actual real cost is probably about 100000 uh, but because Book Trust have uh, been very active in fundraising and have uh, some unfettered funds at the moment, uh, we are saying, you know, we could contribute this if you could give us that. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. All right. William Humphrey. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thank you all very much for your very impressive presentation. I think um, very disappointing and completely short-sighted for the funding to be cut in the first place, I have to say. Um, when you listen to the figures and read the presentation we have here of 100,000 books in the last year, I think, 50,000 families and 4,000 baby packs. Whenever the mantra is trotted out that early intervention is cheaper and it's more effective, there's a perfect example of why government should be supporting this. Um, I had other questions, but you, you've answered them, but I would just make the point I agree entirely with what Kate said in terms of libraries. No, uh, libraries and I do fantastic work. But obviously the uh, libraries across Northern Ireland in terms of the estate has been cut. Uh, so the accessibility is an issue, particularly in rural communities. Uh, young parents, young single parents who don't have cars, how do they get into the libraries? It is intimidating for them. All of that is absolutely right. Um, and you know, the, the, the truth of it is as well um, that I think... We, we need to look at this, and I think £50,000 in the overall context of the Northern Ireland mm. budget mm. is, is um, uh, absolutely essential. And why should the kids here be any different than any other part of the United Kingdom anyway? So I think we would be completely in support of that. Thank you, William. Uh, Robbie Butler. Thank you, guys. I'm sorry I had to the about in powder my nose. Um, but, and, and forgive me, Chair, if, if anything has been repeated here, but... It felt to me a wee bit like being in the Dragon's Den. And uh, <laughs> if I can have your indulgence, I'll be Tuker Suleiman, and I'll offer you all of the money for all of the books for all of our children. And, and I'll advise you later on, we can't do any of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if, that's, if this was Dragon's Den, you said, speaking personally, <laughs> you, did, you did a great job uh, in, in presenting the facts, as, as I would say them. Um, and it, particularly like the, the, the evidence based on the unintended uh, benefits or consequences of um, of this the type of work, and I mean I'll just go across each of these, but but your own Kate, your own um, uh, ability to 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 tell us some personal background into your your, your mental state through pregnancy, which is a very common uh, issue for for pregnant mothers and often overlooked, and and the benefit of this for you and, and your and, and your, your 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 baby. Um, the Sure Start program, in terms of your confidence in, in buying into the product and, and, and putting your money where your mouth is, which, yeah. is, which is an R mat trait, I suppose, mm -hmm. I would say, perhaps. And, and Shoni, um, I have a wee question for you, actually, if it's, if it's okay, because I love the, the work that's being yeah, done. I'd be the, delighted if you ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> he always does this to me every week. Daniel gets a free reign. <laughs> Daniel's <laughs> free reign. <laughs> he can talk away. He, 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 and I always get this hurry up, Robbie. But the, the neurodevelopmental stuff, I think that's, that's going to be key for us in terms of tackling the mental health uh, problems that we have here in Northern Ireland. You talked about encouraging uh, young expecting mothers to talk to their bump or their unborn baby. 
how far back would you, as a, as a, as a midwife perhaps, or, or, or whatever, how far back would you be sort of well, we, giving that sort of advice yeah. to young well, pregnant we mums? See, there was a question. There was, he got there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we recruit from young mums as early as possible, so usually from about 12 weeks or whenever the book and the pregnancy is viable, but generally from about six months. But we'll be doing that work really right from the start because the more you can talk about it, the more you can point it out. And also, it's, they get a wee bit embarrassed. People, you know, yes. they look at you, especially teenagers, and you're saying to them, talk to your bump, touch your bump, sing to your bump. But honestly, and just to come back, I know I didn't get to answer that point, but if I don't, my head of service will take my head off. <laughs> in terms of screen time and that over um, stimulation of children and how it prevents that real close attachment and bond and um, you know, it's so important to come back to basics, to actual books and sitting and reading and listening to your children. So um, as early as possible is the answer, I suppose. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Chair, Karen Mullen. Thank you. Um, and thank you so all for your presentation. I think um, when Liz, when you spoke, you know, you're thinking that you don't even need the other contributors, but everybody added so much and give to it today. So thanks for that. Um, you know how I feel about book trust? An excellent project. Um, as a parent, I benefited from it uh, myself. And but, and now two teenagers, you're constantly trying to encourage them um, to read. But they don't have the benefits of books in the home, so hopefully they'll come back to it. Um, Kate, thank you so much for um, sharing your personal story. There's much of it I can relate to, um, and I totally agree with you that um, it is not a luxury and it should and it should not be a lottery. Every child deserves um, to be part of the book trust and to have books in the home. Um, I think we touched on the technology and the change in world. For me, this is a back step in terms of early intervention. You heard, um, I think all of you maybe were here for our earlier um, presentation um, with the department and all the members around the table were very passionate on Sure Start nurture units, mental health and wellbeing, physical health, and you'll see that over the last couple of weeks in the committee. So for us, I think you're pushing at an open door here, and like Robbie, I would love to give you the money, but I do think um, we're, we have the, the presentation coming in next week where we're going to explore earlier intervention, so we will um, uh, obviously try and maybe explore this. But again, I just want to say thank you so much for coming in. We, we see the huge benefits and it's really something that it should be funded and every child should get, so thank you. Thank you. Catherine Kelly. Thank you so much, um, Kate. I was ready to cry. You could probably see me whenever you were telling your story. Um, books start um, in relation to the North West um, and in particular West Rhone, um, Fermanagh, very rural. Um, you mentioned, Liz, that there has been an issue with, I suppose, getting the, the, that service out in, in particular areas, and I would assume that that was prob is probably one of the areas that has been, there's been difficulty. Actually, Catherine, it was more around the funding rather than the service. It's just we, we in Belfast, for example, we had funding through Belfast Harbour for Belfast Sure Starts, but we haven't actually been able, we've just been able to work with what we had. If we did have funding, whether it be universal or for the North West or anywhere, mm -hmm. then we have a universal health service and they're our delivery partners. So it wouldn't be a problem getting packs out no matter where. Okay. Children and families were, it, it was more a funding issue. I think that yeah. um, it, it just proves how important it actually is that this funding um, goes to Big Start and that every child that it is universal and Again, like you said, Kit, that it isn't a lottery and it isn't a luxury. It should just be. Um, and every child should have that opportunity. Thanks. I hadn't actually considered the, the rural accessibility <coughs> issue here as well and, and delivering it universally via health visitors. Accesses areas, you know, that, that may find it even harder to access services otherwise. So, um, OK, thanks very much. Justin? Another question, just, just to congratulate you all on a, a passionate, very informed and heartwarming presentation. And thank you very much for that. And uh, I think in, in line with what's been mentioned already, um, I'm in. Thank you, man. Thank you. Um, Morris Bradley. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, like you, thank you all for your presentation. As uh, somebody who gets great pleasure out of reading books of the grandchildren, 
I have a son and a daughter who's probably, they're probably older than four of those ladies and gentlemen over there. But anyway, that's <laughs> neither here or there. Daniel's away. But no, it's a fantastic, and, and I know that uh, through, through childcare, uh, my youngest granddaughter, she's three, coming four, she tells me. Uh, she gets immense pleasure out of reading books, and books have advanced her so much. My only question is a question. Why did you pitch so low? Um, yeah, I've, I've asked myself that question as well. It, I suppose it was a calculated risk. Uh, we hear so much about budgetary pressures, and I'm very aware that <clears throat> the Department of Education has those pressures. I suppose it was um, an attempt to get in, get back. Um, yes, we, we could ask for the two programmes back, the baby and the preschool programme. Uh, that would be our ideal. I don't know, maybe I made a wrong call, but I, I felt that uh, we needed to get, get back in. And the fact that we had a new and refreshed programme this year just seemed the right time to do it. And as I say, very happy to monitor and evaluate and feedback then, hopefully with a view to, to getting funding sustained um, and possibly even a, a second intervention built in at preschool. Thank you very do much. You, thanks, Morris. Thank do you, you have um, approximate um, ideas what the preschool programme costs? Sorry. Do, do you know approximately what the preschool programme would cost to reintroduce? It, it would be similar. It would be similar levels similar to, to the baby okay. pack. Yeah. Okay. I did actually clear that with my chief executive in <laughs> case that was a question. The, that, that's all questions from members. Thank you very much indeed for your, your presentation. We'll consider um, our actions on your behalf, which I, I'm sure will be the right to the education minister and to include comments, support of your presentation in the supply uh, debate next week. Um, I'm con I'm, I am conscious that you know there are a number of departments, certainly education and health, that have you know, clear outcomes that are achieved by this work. And if, you know, if necessary, although it is not a significant amount of money that's being asked, but if necessary, there are good examples of more than one department pooling resources together, in which case you could be asking for £25,000 from the Department of Health, £25,000 from the Department of Education. Active school travel budget, for example, pulls £1 million from infrastructure and £1 million from education, for example. So th there are a small number of examples of pooled budgets um, that might be possible as well. I, I, in addition to the amount, I think it's, it's a statement from the departments of support for this type of work to to offer some degree of funding as well, and I think as members have suggested that it, that it's very hard to understand why that that statement of support as as well as financial allocation hasn't been possible. But we we'll take that away. Hopefully, you've been encouraged by the questions and the responses of support you've received today. Thank you very much for the work that you're doing, and maybe um, we can. Uh, visit or, or host you in, in line with some of the, the awareness raising measures around reading and literacy that are, are undertaken throughout the year. Um, it's been a privilege for me to, to learn more about the work um, and to use a number of the books with uh, my kids at home who absolutely love them. Um, so we'll, we'll be in touch to follow that up with you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Uh, we'll leave some packs here and the theory of change. Uh, so Thanks very much look, indeed. If there's anything else that you need from me, please let me Thank know. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thank you. OK, members, um, I'll ask the clerk to summarise actions um, and suggest that, we, that one of those actions would be to write to the Education Minister um, in strong support of consideration of allocating funding to support the work of, of Book Trust and, if necessary, allude to the fact that if other departments, such as the Department of Health, would be beneficial to cooperate in that allocation, that that's given consideration as well. But ask the clerk to summarise. So, Chair, in addition to that, the committee also want to write to the Committee for Health, um, indicating its support and asking their chair to say words in support at the supply resolution debate next week. I can agree to that, yeah. 
and yep. also maybe suggesting we write to the Minister that um, the Department gives consideration to adding um, something around this to the um, next, next programme for government, excuse me, measures, uh, so around uh, you know, uh, literacy at uh, uh, preschool, etc. And uh, I think the committee has already indicated support for parental engagement in education, so maybe there's something to be explored there um, around that, if the committee is content. Great, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, then we're also then writing back to Book, Tr Book Trust, thanking them and uh, looking forward to future engagement. I think World Book Day might be the 10th of March. It's, I think it's in March think anyway. Right, yeah, yeah. So it, it's coming up any road. So maybe there'll be something that the committee can do there if the chair is content and Robbie yeah. wants to come in. Yep. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, guys. Uh, just on, I don't know if the question was asked maybe when I left or not, but um, did they discuss the funded model in the other devolved institutions, Scotland and Wales? What, what that looks like? Could maybe ask them to give us that as well? Yeah, we can ask. I suspect it's possibly in the briefing somewhere as well. But my, my understanding is that a, a universal first year reading intervention is f directly funded in the rest of the regions, but yet we can either ask for that or draw that I out of the briefing for you. Um, I just, the, the multiple benefits mm. and outcomes that are achieved in ter across <clears throat> health and education, child health development, language development, attachment, addressing uh, you know, literacy and educational underachievement issues, it, ju it, it just seems multiple, not, you know. And you're, I, and you're not going to spend another £50,000 anywhere near as well and get... I don't, I don't know, know, you know. There's just the implications as well, you know, when you pick up the, the, the judiciary. You know, and even yeah. from a rural point of view as well, in terms of access to reading materials, I, the, the, we, we have heard multiple presentations as to how much pressure there are on, on the budgets, but one would like to think between two departments at the very least there, you could find that sum of money just to make sure that goes to every home. And the positive aspect of it as well is it's a it's an organisation that has has gotten on, even with the, the the reduced funding has tried to sustain it, has formed partnerships with, with other organisations. So um, members are content, we'll take those actions forward. Karen, you want Just to really, come in? Yeah, yeah to that, that the department would work with Book Trust around um, an application process. You know, there's an extra, they're going to bid for extra funding for early intervention. Hmm. You know, it's, it's minimal, we've all agreed, so yeah, I'm sure it should be coming from somewhere, that. yeah. Okay. Sorry, can I just say, Jerry, yeah. the secret, I think, in the longer term is the point that, the, that Peter made to place an emphasis on how we get this into the programme for government yeah. uh, over the longer period term rather than just react to a presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, members, uh, move us on to agenda item seven then, which is correspondence, and we'll proceed through this at pace. And I will propose to um, forward plan our forward work programme and inquiry discussion for another session as well, if members are able to indulge me to clear the correspondence here to finish the committee meeting today. Clark, do you want to speak to the correspondence? Thanks, Chairperson. Yep. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay, so um, there's a summary note at um, 7.1, which is at page 49. Um, and, uh, if members are content to note the items of correspondence uh, as indicated there with the following um, exceptions. So the first one is at 7.3, which is page 57. This is from the Regional Voluntary Youth Organisations Network, and they provided a list of questions regarding the new um, funding arrangements for youth provision. If the committee are content, Chairperson, for, the, um, for this to be forwarded to the Education Authority for them to come back with an answer. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Um, I think we are up of our quorum, we're all right. Um, so at 7.5 then is an invitation from the Education Authority to the Chair and Deputy Chair to the Youth Services Oscars on Monday 23rd, 6.30pm in Millennium Forum. So is committee content for Chair and Deputy Chair to attend, diaries permitting, and I'm conscious that's a plenary day so it might be difficult for anybody to attend. Agreed. Agreed. Lovely. So 7.6, um, which is page 125. So this is a response from the Minister regarding the Struhl campus. The Minister has indicated that works must commence by May 2021, at the latest, if the schools are to open in um, September 2024. Um, could I ask Chairperson of the Committee content to write to the Department seeking information on the ongoing related projects which are mentioned in the letter, including the range of shared education initiatives being led by the schools, and maybe for the Committee to visit Struhl after Easter? 
and then maybe we could go to, we might, I haven't talked to them yet, maybe we could visit Orville Lee, um, and you could see a special school, and then maybe have a, we might be able to get a tour of the site. If uh, Now would be a good time as well, because the works on the ground have stopped, um, and the, the construction um, men who were there are all gone. Um, we were told that, met with the Minister yesterday, and we were told that. Um, Karen and I um, visited the site, it would have been this time last year maybe, um, so it would be good to see how it has come on since mm -hmm. then, and to get a visit to Arvillae as well, so that other members can, can see, see it. Indeed, Chairperson, and the Arvillae School, as the members are aware, is a 3-19 to 19 special school, so this was the model that uh, the Education Authority was keen on rolling out across Northern Ireland, so any route. Okay, uh, so agreed. Yeah. Great. So 7.7, .7, which is page 128. This is a response from the department providing an update on Fresh Start and School Enhancement Programme. Members wish to note that the department has identified the 23 Fresh Start projects, which will account for the remaining 470 million uh, estimated of expenditure, subject to confirmation from HM Treasury that the capital spend can indeed be reprofiled over the next um, five years. Six of the projects are shared education projects. One of those is SCREW. 17 would appear to be either new builds or rebuilds of integrated schools. Um, now the department hasn't provided approximate costings or timings, um, and it is that that's quite a lot. It's a big program, um, to be sure. So is the um, committee content to write back to the department just seeking further clarity? So timings and costings, estimated timings, estimated costings Agreed. for those uh, fresh start projects. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, members. Um, and then we have 7.8, page 133. This was around legacy financial deficits and capital projects. So what I think the department has said is that if new DNA money is not provided to settle legacy deficits, schools may still find themselves ineligible for certain capital programmes. Mm -hmm. They also appear to say that if they do get the new DNA money, um, legacy deficits would be written off over time where schools have taken all possible actions uh, to reduce spending. So uh, I'm not sure of an action on that one, members. Um, maybe just keep it under advisement. Yeah, okay. Okay, then. So then we get to 712, uh, page 163. Um, this was a response on SEND provision in Irish medium education. And the, well, there was some breakdown on the, the January monitoring allocation and also a bit more about SEND cooperation. Um, what the, the department advises is that the Education Authority is to consider the establishment of formal learning support and autism specific provision in some IME schools. They also advise about cooperation with other departments and arm's length bodies in respect of SEN. So members may particularly want to note the SEN steering group and the notification referral and statutory assessment project. So this is about speeding up statementing. Um, I would think. Um, so uh, again, um, we are going to get something of a briefing on this uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So unless members have any comments, we'll note. I think we'll note it and For raise now. it at that briefing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. agreed. Uh, so yeah. then we have 7.13, page 168. Here's the response on sport and physical education in schools. So they've re re revised and refreshed the curriculum sports program, now the sports program. There's to be an independent review of this program and a review of PE in schools is also to be undertaken by ETI. Um, so our members content to write back to the department, seeking timescales in terms of reference for the reviews, and perhaps also to invite IFA and GAA to come and brief jointly on this. Um, it probably would be after Easter now, but yeah, yeah. members happy to do that. Lovely. Agreed. Then we have um, page 176, correspondence from AWARE, and they're seeking to meet with the committee to discuss uh, positive mental health, and they've, they've given information on the, the services and that they provide. I'll ask members if they're content to add AWARE to the list of organisations that we're going to invite to the mental health and wellbeing event. Um, yep. So I'm thinking, Chairperson, that event may be a bit bigger. So I've, I've already written to the department, asked them to say who they have consulted with or who they are going to consult with, read the framework. They'll come back to me with that list. Hopefully we'll turn that into an event, which might be an evening event, it might be pretty big. In the end, if members are happy enough to do that. Happy enough, Good. yeah, agreed. So, um, A or B. Okay, Clark. Uh, members, any other business um, you wish to discuss? Um, I have no any other business. Members content? Okay. 
Um, agenda item 9 then is our forward plan in regards inquiry options. Clark, I propose that we forecast that to next meeting. That, yep. that okay? And then forward work programme, Clark, you need to speak to a few matters here. Yep. Yeah, chairperson. Yep. Um, okay, so next week, um, what we've had planned was a briefing on early years in childcare and also a briefing on nurture programme. Now, I think what the department appears to have undertaken there is to give us to make that briefing really about early intervention so that we talk about nurture and sure start and extended schools. Is that what you want members or those are quite big. Um, are you content maybe to just talk about nurture next week and um, maybe we would schedule in the extended schools and the sure start and in your hands here um, because they are quite large, they're important issues. Do you want to talk about them, think about them a bit more? Nurture. Yeah, the, the original intention, uh, my understanding is, was it was effectively about childcare and nurture as well. Um, well yeah. Just Sure Start is big and important. I mean, nur so nur extended schools. Nurture is more connected to Sure Start and extended yeah. schools. I mean, do, do we regroup those together at another day and go with the childcare briefing? Or where is the department at on the child care briefing? Are they going to be able to give us a fair bit of detail? Well, as indicated, I, I think not, because okay. uh, they said that their budget bid is between one and fifty million, mm -hmm. so they don't know what options they're going to. Um, they're well, going then, to do pursue. we suspend the child care aspect of it and go for nurture, share, start, and extended schools? Are they adequately connected, uh, um, or too big? Is that, is that all we're doing in the morning? Actually, there's more. Um, yeah, what I can see the time. Um, the department has asked to give a closed session uh, on the uh, pandemic influenza emergency bill. So this is Westminster legislation, which um, will be around uh, closure powers for schools in the event of a pandemic. So they, they want to do that rather quickly. They want to do that in closed. Um, I'm not sure how long that will take, but that is, that's quite a heavy session. So. Um, well, maybe we do that in childcare then, and we plan properly for the nurture, mm -hmm. extended schools, and sure start. Does that make sense? Or, well, we, we've queued them up on nurture. Right. So remember, we take nurture and, and then come back on extended schools and sure start. Then would you be happy? Well done, Peter. I think no, nurture no, no. and sure start <laughs> Just go together. Uh, right. Okay. So remove. So yes, aggregate extended schools then. Leave um, extended schools. Yeah. School? Okay, but but keep sure start. Yeah. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, they are. I mean, extended schools is not just thirty years. No, this, there yeah. is a differentiation That's true. there. That's true. That, so you can go childcare, nurture, and sure start. That that is early years, and we're leaving, we're leaving childcare out. Oh, we're leaving childcare well, out. Well, I, I think we we keep it in, um, but I don't think they're going to tell you very much. So expectations should be adjusted accordingly. Okay. Right. And then we'll, and we'll, they'll, they'll have to come back again. And we'll reschedule a briefing on extended schools then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Content members, yeah. Yep. Okay. Right. Very right. good. Well done. Um, also, uh, members, there's a few things here. Uh, I'll be quick. Fourth of March, uh, we're getting a briefing on the independent report on integrated education. Only one of the report authors is available. It's Colin Kavanagh. He's happy enough to do it on his own, and his co-author doesn't mind. So, if the committee is content um, with that, and Chair, um, would the committee therefore be uh, content to uh, arrange a visit? to Oak Grove Integrated um, and uh, maybe to hear formal evidence from NICE and IEF at another time. Okay, yep, okay, agreed. Very good. And then... Um, I take it the, vi the visit to Oak Grove Integr Integrated obviously isn't next week. Though. No, 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 yeah, no. It'll be sometime, okay. sometime yep. in the future. Okay. So one member right. will get a lie in that day. Okay, but, agreed. Um, <laughs> there may be not. Um, and as indicated previously, uh, on the 11th of March, I know the committee's writing to the minister, but just to remind members that... Um, the special school principals will come along with the education authority to give us their briefing on the 11th of March and that will be followed by the department giving their briefing on their own on the special educational needs framework but the committee has asked for the education authority to come back about soon and come back soon about SEN and particularly around uh, statementing issues okay. so if we're happy enough with that well happy to the extent agreed with that, that approach yes, yep. 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 thank you yep. um, and then finally um, the department has asked if we can reschedule the children and young people strategy to 
the 18th of March, so it's currently down as 1st of April. Um, they, they want to speak to the committee before they go to the executive. So they've asked to come a bit early. So 18th of March, we're doing a joint session with our colleagues in the Committee for the Economy around the 14th and 19th strategy. So after that, if we're happy enough to do the 14th, sorry, to do the uh, children, young people strategy. Okay. Okay. Too much? It's, uh, I think they're two big, big pieces. Okay. Uh. Right. Okay, then. So more drastic surgery may be required. Right, mm. okay. No, I'm conscious that these are big briefings. It's after one o'clock and we're still here. So, um, yes. And, um, Who are we annoying? Who are we annoying? Here. <laughs> um, we're, we're going to annoy the Committee for the Executive Office. Well, yeah, it depends who they're seeing, yes. <laughs> indeed. Um, yes, yes. Um, so, members, um, okay. So the clerk will uh, come up with a better solution than that, and shortly. Okay. Um, okay then. Uh, also, chairperson, uh, our members also. Uh, I think the deputy chair had indicated that uh, she wanted to uh, put in a visit to Triax in the northwest around youth issues. Yeah, we talked about visits, and I suppose last week, you know, after I had um, the committee, had went to Oak Grove the next day, and they have uh, a nurture unit, so that uh, so that's a post primary school with a nurture, and I know we're visiting primary, and I know um, we were going to do a visit to Derry, and we were considering for our learning community, but um, just for a wee bit of a difference, um, it was the uh, Youth Work Alliance that contacted me, so. Rather, I know we'll be visiting a lot of schools and meeting a lot of principals, so I'd put forward the request to the clerk that if we do that, we would do the Youth Work Alliance and then do a visit to Oak Grove, to the nurture unit, and then members can travel home. In the same day, yeah, yeah. is that viable? Yeah, yeah. 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 Or Triax and Oak Grove reasonably close together? Not too far. Okay. It's on, too, it, Oak Grove's on your way home, so okay. it's over the bridge then, and it's... Uh, put, we can yep. put a schedule schedule together and we'll confirm yeah. that. Yeah, right, okay. Okay, okay. that's that. Okay. I'm thinking about everything else. Team based questioning session? Well, we'll agreed. Maybe. Agreed. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that agreed, members, yes. that you would like a team based um, questioning session so we would get, like, uh, there's some. Um, Daniel Greenberg, I think yeah. it was before. Yep. Yeah, so there are professionals yep. who can come in and advise members how to um, agreed. act as a team and ask ASAP. questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Same okay. thing. Okay, folks. Um, date, time, place of next meeting. Then, Sorry, is, sure. yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead um, yeah, yeah. I would be very interested in visits to New York Normal. So you said before that oh. New York Normal is a constituency you've never visited before. It's educated education committee. So I'd be interested in exploring that, and um, possibly through the four or uh, this Nally schools, New York City or Armagh City. Um, just go back to the. Correspondence. Forgive me. You can buy the correspondence from the Education Committee on the Curriculum Sports Programme, and they've, they've agreed to undertake a review. Can we write back to them and propose that the current level of funding is retained until that view that review has been completed? Happy to include that in the correspondence. Yep. Okay. Agreed. Okay. And Catherine, Catherine, yeah. Can I also propose when we're talking about visits? Can I also propose a visit to? Last year start in Oma. Okay. Where, sorry? In Oma. Last okay. year start. Sure start. Email details of that through to the clerk. Yes. We'll put it on a schedule for consideration. That okay? Well, sure starts to throw off. Given this. <laughs> sure start East Belfast. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few there, right? Right, so members <laughs> will... <laughs> will <laughs> so members will come back to the clerk with some uh, details, contact details of those, and I'll okay. work that into the programme. And we're here next week at uh, 9.45 for our normal committee. All right, thanks very much, folks. Thank you. On the Assembly Committee Room 30.